Hello? Is there anyone there? Participants to me and Michelle. Hey, Michelle. How are you? You're here very early. <laughs> All right, I'm going to stop the recording now. Just doing a test. We just need to check hey, the I'm going to turn on chat. All right, it's recording now. How's that? Hey, thank you. Um, okay. Uh, oh, some people have turned their cameras on. Thank you very much, guys. That's absolutely fantastic. You, you all go to the top of the list. So you're the people I see uh, first. Uh, that is really good. Oh, it's so nice to see so many of you. Some of you I haven't seen for ages. A summer. Hi, Alyssa. Hi. Um, Mark. Hi. Evie. Evie just disappeared. She was there briefly. There she is. Hey, Ian. That's fantastic. Lillian. Thanks everyone. Tom. I can see you now um, playing the uh, play school game. So everyone, welcome. We're doing communication. Why are we doing communication? It's a security course. It's not a communication course. Um, as I was saying just a second ago, years ago, we didn't teach communication in this course. Bonus mark for camera on. I reckon absolutely. Definitely should go in your portfolio as community, helping the community. Well done. Um, so why not? Uh, yeah, what was the problem with not teaching communication? Well, all my early graduates went out, but like around the year 2000, and they went out into industry and they had cyber roles and they had to influence people in order to get things done. They had to show people vulnerabilities and get people to fix them. They had to persuade boards to give them money. They had to get promoted. They had to encourage people to put attention into security when no one wanted to. Um, without communication, you're sort of nothing. Um, what's the best example of that? Oh, yeah. Global warming. Scientists have known about global warming for so long. I found some old notes from when I started teaching back in the 90s. How depressing is that? And I did a class on global warming and talking about why aren't we doing anything about it? What's going on? We all brainstormed about that and tried to work out ways. That was in the 90s. So we're still really not doing anything about it. How can it be? Um, you know, people blame politicians. I blame scientists. How can scientists be so incompetent as to know about this danger? before anyone and not have actually brought about change. They just grumble and complain. You know, they actually needed to be able to work out how to affect change. Politicians affect change. Business people affect change. Ugly, nasty corporations affect change. Why don't the good guys affect change? All right, why they don't is because we're hopeless at communication, particularly scientists and mathematicians and maybe even security people too. So let's learn how to communicate, not because we want to hear the sound of our own voice, but because we want to have change. We want to have impact in the world. So, um, so now we always have a unit on change and communication and how to affect up and down, how to manage up and how to manage down, how to bring about change. Um, now, Last year, when the guys that went to Amazon were doing the uh, Amazon Web Security Project, um, were doing their final presentation to all the big wigs at Amazon, and I was there too, um, they all gave a big presentation. And at the end, after everyone had gone, I stayed back and gave them um, presentation notes to, to improve their presentation. And because they're all senior students just about to graduate, in fact, most of them have graduated and gone on to amazing jobs, uh, I was pretty ruthless. And I just told them actually what I thought because the, everyone from Amazon was saying, oh, how nice. Oh yeah, you guys are really good. Oh, that was really impressive. And I thought, yeah, that's because you're sort of thinking students aren't very good. But if some of your employees gave a talk like this, you would just roast them because it wasn't very good. So the, the work they'd done was good. But the way they communicated it and presented it and argued for funding and bringing about change, that, that wasn't good. So I, I said, look, no, 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 no. And I went through this long list of things that they could have done better and they could have done differently in different ways they could have thought about it and how they should have approached it differently. And at the end, I was worried a bit that I've been negative. And I said, oh, guys, I'm really sorry I was negative. This is a great day for you and everything's good, but I just know you're better than this and you can do fantastically well. And they were actually really enthusiastic. A couple have spoken to me since, uh, just out of the blue, just saying that was one of the best bits um, that they got from me in that course. <laughs> really nothing else was any good. Because, um, because actually it shocked them and made them change how they communicate. And one of them said something, this is what I'm telling you, this long-winded story. He said, you know, as you were giving us all this feedback, I remembered, oh, this is what we covered in security engineering. You've told us this stuff already. You know, I feel really stupid because I knew it and I didn't use it. And, and he went away and he didn't know, he just said the most devastating thing in the whole world to me. 
because what he was saying wasn't that he was stupid. What he was saying was that I, Richard, had failed. I had tried to communicate something and change the people. And I'd said all the words and done all the things and put it in the exam and all that sort of stuff. But they hadn't changed. At the end, they were still communicating in the same way. Now, I think after it happened twice, hopefully they've changed. But this is my way of leading into the whole point of communication. So before we jump into the details, people always want to know little technical things about, oh, where do you stand? And do you do PowerPoint? And, and all that sort of stuff, all these little tips. But before we get to that, the sort of tactics, we should talk about the bigger picture, the strategies or even the goals. So what are we trying to do with communication? Let's get that really clear. As far as I'm concerned, there's only one point to communication. And this applies to all communication. Communication is there so you can bring about change. If you're not bringing about change, then you're not communicating. And if you're communicating, but it doesn't have to lead to anything changing, then why are you talking? You're just an empty drum of clashing symbols. For heaven's sake, if you're talking, you're going to bring about change. There's no other reason. So before you start any piece of communication, regardless of who's asked you to do it and what they've said and all the blah, blah, blah words people have said, you yourself work out in your own mind before you start, why am I doing this? What change do I want to bring about? Now, you might think of seven or eight or nine or 100 things you want to do. That's fine. But what I encourage you to do is just pick one and write that down and focus on that. And that is your main thing because you're lucky to pull one off. Maybe you can get two. You'll never get 100. So pick the main one and anything else is icing on the cake and have firmly fixed in your mind what is the main change I want to achieve with this communication event I'm just about to do. So that's step one. Write that down. Step two is that you then have to understand the people you're talking to. Oh, I had a prop. Where was it? Hang on. Prop. My shoes. My boots. I was going to bring up the boots of my girls too, but I just brought mine up. Um, you cannot bring about a change in someone without understanding them. Just forget it. They're not robots. They're human beings. They're elaborate, complex machines on a predetermined path already. And you've got a really small bandwidth sort of hole into their head where you can get in. You can affect change through this tiny little thing using their eyes and their ears and their mouth and their, and their smell and their touch, using all their senses, which isn't that bigger pipe. You have access to their brain briefly while you're talking to them and they're giving you attention. So how are we going to bring about change? Well, change is inside them. It's not in the world. It's not in you. It's in them. How do you bring about change in them? You need to understand them. You need to work out how can I use that brief moment I've got with them and those brief channels to bring about the change in their mind. So communication, this is point number two. Communication is not about what you say. It's not about what you do. Communication is all about the impact it has on your listener or listeners and regard them as a series of individual people. They're not a group. So at the end of the, often I hear lecturers saying, oh, I covered that in the lecture or, oh, I, I, I felt I gave a good lecture. I felt I didn't give a good lecture. And it's all about them and what they're saying. And I know people that think that teaching is about explaining. And what sometimes when I ask people to apply for the job, you know, if you want to be a tutor or a lecturer or something like that, I say, why do you think you'd be a good tutor or lecturer? And often they talk about how good they are at explaining things. And I'm going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because, you know, that's an okay skill. You know, it's better than not having that skill, I guess. But that is not the main skill. And if you think that's the main skill, that's dangerous because teaching or communication isn't about explaining. It's about, which is something you do, it's about changing them. It's something that happens inside their head. It's really easy to forget that. I've just said it probably seems obvious, but I bet the next time you speak, you forget it. It's so easy to forget that. So somehow burn it into your brain that all you're trying to do when you communicate is change someone else. So communication is about the listener. It's not about the speaker. Now, um, why do I know that doesn't work? Why do I know people forget that? Because I look at so much communication that goes on and it's a disaster. A lot of government communications, I look at them, they're very expensive. You can see some on, um, it's a good show that analyzes government communication. What's that? The Gruen transfer. If you can ever see the Gruen transfer on ABC, sometimes they look at government political advertising and do a reasonable analysis. Um, it's often written to make the minister happy or the person commissioning it happy or the organization that does it happy. I'd even go so far as to say official emails from sometimes UNSW or other unis are all in this category too. It's sort of designed and the listener is the person paying for it or funding it or sending it out. That's, that's what the people building it are thinking about. But actually the listener has to be the person receiving the message. Um, what's a good example? 
All right, there's two ones. One's that very funny video, and I'll show it when we get a break. I've just remembered that. I'm going to write it down. That's it. I won't tell you what it is. You might have already thought about it. It's so dreadful. Um, uh, the other example is this. When I used to be a wee lad walking around uh, in my teenage years trying to earn money, I got it by delivering leaflets, which means I'd have a haversack on my back full of pamphlets and I'd walk around the suburbs pushing leaflets in people's letterboxes. Hey, um, i just looking at the messages everyone's writing. It's very nice. Um, so... A leaflet deliverer is an interesting job. It's quite hard. It's very heavy, especially at the start. And then towards the end, it's quite light. It's good for optimization. I must say, I spent a lot of my time working out graph traversal algorithms and ways of going around the, the thing. So I just did minimum walking and things like that. It was all very quite interesting. But here's the thing. You're often in a slightly stressed state while you're doing it if it's heavy and raining and you've got a deadline and you've sort of left it till the last day to do it. And sometimes you come across letterboxes where people don't want leaflets in their letterbox. They don't want advertising material. So they put communication on the box. They put a little sign on. And I've seen so many different signs because I read them all as I'm delivering the leaflets. And I remember one, most of them look like this. And it's one in particular I'm thinking of. It said, no junk mail, exclamation mark, with a picture of a really angry face or something like that. And I circle and a line through it and just a lot of anger. And I don't know, I'd be walking around and I'm paid to put it in your letterbox. That's my job. I'll get in trouble if I don't put it in the letterbox. And I'm walking up to the letterbox. I've gone to a lot of trouble to get to your letterbox. And then there's an angry sign at it shouting at me, telling me not to do something with exclamation marks. Stuff you. I would just put it in the letterbox. Um, and I remember there was this one angry guy. Here's the one I'm thinking about that used to come out. And I think he later on became a liberal politician. Hmm. Um, but uh, this was when he was quite young. And he would come out and he would just shout at me angrily. And he would say, get rid of this. And once he took it out and he ripped it up and threw it on the ground and said, but, you know, whatever, don't put this in my letterbox. So I would wait till he wasn't around. I'd put it in. And on the way back, I'd put another one in. And sometimes I'd make a special trip to stuff a couple more in because I was a 15 year old boy and he'd been shouting at me, making me feel terrible. So I was angry with him. So, uh, you know, I just hated him really. That was a bit negative of me. So I would, whenever possible, put leaflets in his letterbox. All right, why am I telling you this long and somewhat not very positive reflection on me story for this reason? The people putting the letterbox signs on the letterboxes weren't thinking about communication and bring about change. They were venting their anger when they were buying those signs. They, they must be very angry that they got letters and leaflets in their letterbox. I don't know why, but they must have got very angry about it. And they were venting that anger in the sign they chose to put on the letterbox. It was entirely about them, that piece of communication. And they weren't thinking there's a testosterone driven 15 year old boy who's tired and a bit weary and stressed who's pushing these into all the letterboxes. They weren't thinking about me. You know, there were other people that put different signs on. Can anyone imagine? Just stop and think now. What sign would you put on your letterbox so I don't put a leaflet in it? Just think about it. Um, maybe like a solution would be to sell them. Um, Hi, I'm not going to read your um, junk notes. Please, like, let's be wary of the environment and to give it to someone who's interested. Yeah, yeah. So give me a reason. That's right, Aaron. That's a good one. Um, I've got to say, saying junk makes me, it, I mean, you're sort of attacking me. Um, so that actually, it, when anyone, I don't know if you've noticed this, I've noticed this a lot with children. Um, if you're communicating to someone and you say angry things or criticize them, there's something in their brain that switches off and they stop listening. Now, it's not just their brain, it's my brain. It's just very hard to notice things about yourself. But since not having children, I've noticed that I'm the same. If someone says anything critical at all, it's very hard. I have emotional reactions. It's very hard to listen to what's going on. But yeah, that's exactly right. Give me a reason. That's a good one. Police property, no junk mail. No, he's sort of trying to threaten me. I'm a 15-year-old boy. I don't care. Um, police property, right. Stuff you. But, uh, but good on you for trying. Uh, yeah. Um, I try and make sort of light of the situation, something like my neighbor likes mail more than I do, or my neighbor really likes discounts, something like that. Please, yeah, don't, don't give one Make to it humorous, yeah. like him. Give him experts. <laughs> That's awesome, Tim. Thank you. Yeah, I reckon you're now starting to think the way you need to think to solve the problem. You're trying to get inside the mind of the deliverer. Maybe what you should do before you even put the signs out is just watch a couple of days and see who the deliverers are. Maybe sometimes they're 15-year-old boys, maybe they're girls, maybe they're old people. Who knows? And then whatever you do, target it to them. Any more? Because they're great ideas. Anyone else with a thought? 
Don't you get paid like per leaflet you hand out or per certain amount of leaflets though? So by not, by not putting a leaflet in something you've already walked up to, you're actually losing income. That's exactly right, Lauren. So like, is there anything that you can say that will stop someone doing that? Maybe you can give them like a dollar. <laughs> that is a really good thinking. I mean, you're exactly right. I'm paid for the number of leaflets I put in. They spot check households to make sure that I have delivered them and I get in trouble if there is households that don't get them or if someone rings up and complains. Like what if there was an angry letter on the letterbox, but the guy that wrote it wasn't there and he had a visitor coming that day and they really wanted the Kmart catalog and they didn't get it and they rang up and complained to Kmart. Well, Kmart would ring up my distributor and the distributor would call me and they would, well, it wouldn't be good. So yeah, you're absolutely right. My thinking, my interest is not in my interest to not put it in. And you're thinking, oh, how can you solve that interest? Now I've got to say, I only get a cent or two. It's more the fear of getting um, seen as incompetent or dishonest by the pamphlet company. But yeah, that's right. Um, there was some people that put signs up and I didn't put it in. Anyone guess? It was very simple. Put it in the recycling bin, winky face. <laughs> it's getting close. That's clever. But it's still sort of attacking me. It's attacking me in a funny way, but it's still sort of, you know, what I'm doing goes in the bin. Well, I mean, it could, all these things could work. But I'll tell you what worked for me is if someone said the word please, if it wasn't all in caps, if it was in green rather than red or black, uh, winky face is good. And said, oh, oh, please don't give us any leaflets. We don't need them. Or uh, on no leaflets, please. We're trying to save trees. Smiley face. Have a nice day. Something like that. I'd go, oh, you're my best friend. I'm not giving you any leaflets. These bastards put leaflets in there already. I'd reach in and take them out. And some bills. I'd take them out for you. And put them. So you would win me over and get me on side if you thought of me as a person. Um, that's exactly right. So good thinking, everyone. Um, and that is the nature of this problem. I want every, yeah. Here, take my, what's this? P11 instead. What's a P11? PII? Oh. <laughs> Personal information. That's really good. Um, yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, it certainly is the case delivering leaflets. You get intimate with letterboxes and you notice how visible and easy it is to put things in and take things out of letterboxes. Um, okay, so. Um, so the idea of communication, I hope you've got it now, is you need to get in the mind of the other person that you're talking to. All right, here's what I've got. Now I'm going to race through my points super quick. Uh, hypnotizing chickens is the first one. So the, I don't know if you've ever heard of this phrase, but the US Army use it. Yeah, um, it's what they call PowerPoint presentations. So if they have to give um, some information to the media uh, that they don't really want to give them, like, oh, we accidentally killed some civilians or something when we did a bombing raid today. Um, what they do is they give a very long presentation with lots of incomprehensible PowerPoint slides and charts and they're packed full of stuff. And maybe it's 40 slides long and around about slide 37, they slip in, oh, and we killed some civilians today. Uh, and then there's slide 38 and 39, which don't talk about it. And so they have disclosed it, but everyone's there and no one actually listens to that part. And they actually call it hypnotizing chickens, this process of putting up a whole lot of boring stuff on PowerPoint first so people stop listening so you can slip the other thing in. So PowerPoint is a great example of bad communication. It's designed so you feel good about what you've said and it's all about the points you're going to cover. But it's, I think the people that use it are never thinking of the mind of the people looking at it. It's very hard to be interested when you're looking at a PowerPoint. I don't want to pay other people. Tim, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm being distracted in my own lecture. <laughs> and then the lecturer started chatting with people and he wasn't paying attention either. Um, so uh, yeah, so hypnotizing chicken. So PowerPoint, be very, very careful. Shoes, yep, you gotta walk in the miles of the other person, in the shoes of the other person. Walk a mile in their shoes to understand them is, as the old phrase go. That's really what you gotta do. Objective, yes, you've gotta work out what your objectives are. So I gave a talk on recently, did a training exercise for some students um, in the career, a career skill thing in the holidays when we were, I was training them on how to communicate and I gave them little scenarios. So you've now got to make this announcement to this person or you're in this company, you've got to do this, or you're in this embarrassing situation, you have to do this, or you have to, one of them was you had to give a funeral speech and one of them was you had to give an apology for something you're in the government or so I don't know, they're all just a difficult situation. So I give every team a different scenario and then they gave an actual presentation at the end. And then we assessed them all about how well they'd gone. And there was this stark difference between the people that straight away, like my former students, forgot the whole stuff I said at the beginning and just jumped in and tried to make an interesting and entertaining talk. And those that remembered the beginning bit. So I've only moved on a little bit from the beginning, but can you remember it? The most important thing? Gee, that'd be a good, um, be a good, 
good uh, cahoot. I should have put a cahoot in. I forgot. Is it to focus on changing the opinion of the listener? Yes, that's exactly it. Thanks, Ian. Um, it's work out what change you want to bring about. Work out the objective of the talk. And I suggest one change. And then everything relates to that. So if you think, shall, I, shall three of us talk or two of us talk? Shall we all talk or take turns in talking? It's not an issue of fairness. It's not an issue of uh, marking. It's not an issue of anything. It's entirely an issue of what will help us achieve our objective best. If we want to do this difficult conversation and persuade people, um, then maybe it's better if there's one person who's a representative of this all. Maybe it's multiple voices show that we've got consensus or whatever. It, yeah, someone had to give a talk to the vice chancellor to persuade him, to try and persuade him to change trimesters. Um, you know, there was just all these different talks that people had to do. Um, and the people that did that talk actually structured it really well in terms of having lots of people talking and just giving the sense that they're all really reasonable and people that the vice chancellor would like and that there was a critical mass of them that wanted some sort of a change in some way. Not to get rid of trimesters because they'd never achieved that objective. They instead have the objective of making them better in some way. Um, so, uh, so it's like uh, uh, closing the deal. Oh, sorry. So it's like closing the deal for a salesman. It's exactly like closing the deal for a salesman. That's right. A salesman knows what they want, which is the sale. That's exactly. Have you done salesmanship? No, but I had like uh, heard this audio book about a salesman, uh, like how to close a deal. I'm going to write that down. Closing the deal is when the person actually signs, when you actually get the money, and that's your objective. So there's no point in making them happy, showing the car, making them like the car, making them think they'll probably buy the car, promising they'll call you to buy the car, and then they go away and buy it somewhere else cheaper online. You actually need to close the deal at the end, which is... You yeah. need by hook or by crook? <laughs> to sell it. That's right. You have to achieve your objective. Otherwise, there's no point in doing it. So yeah, that's right. In sales, I'm going to learn more about closing the deal. That's a good thing. Om, you're going to say something. Yeah, um, I agree with you, but I'd make a point about it. You have to be very careful when you're deciding what you want because you should never decide on something and not be willing to take something better. Um, so this is, so if you say, for instance, I want to go into this talk wanting X, you shouldn't close your mind off to the possibility of Y, which is better than X. Ah, oh, yeah. Um, and that's something which you can often do if you go in and you're so convinced on doing it. And the other thing to say as well is that if you go in trying to teach somebody something and um, I especially find this teaching, but in lots of situations, what happens is you um, try and teach them this thing and you start to teach something else. Um, and they're actually much more interested in that thing or there you can use their passion in that subject, but you can't do that if all you're trying to do is to teach X. And even as well as that, you also have to be really careful about, seeming disingenuous because if you're only focused on you know selling them a thing or on teaching them x then they're not going to feel like you care and they're not going to learn x whereas if you're like genuinely passionate about it and it's like your goal is to teach them x but you're still happy to do other stuff you're much more likely to teach people things yes can i agree with everything you said then tom they're all really good points can i but can i reframe if i think uh, i'm going to break them into two main areas i want to reframe sure areas because they're both interesting the first one is being open to doing something better and the second one is be careful of seeming disingenuous because that can undermine your thing um let's do them in reverse order the disingenuous thing um i i actually think what you're saying is really important here um it doesn't go to your goal you still have the same goal you've got to go in with a goal but the question is, how do you achieve your goal? And I would argue for any teacher or communicator, uh, you have to, one of the most important things is getting the trust of the person if you're trying to get them to change. And you cannot trick people into trust unless you're amazing. I, I don't even think you can. So you have to be authentic. So if you want to bring about a change in someone, it sort of goes with the territory that you have to care about them, bring them on board, make them think you care about them, and you can't trick them into that. The only way you can make someone think you care about them is to actually care about them. So, or unless you can work out some other really clever way, you know, I would lie to you guys. I would, I would do all sorts of horrible things if I thought it would help teach you because my whole goal is at the end of this course, I want you to be a different sort of person in some way. I want you to have changed in some way. 
And I would do anything to get that. But my personal experience has been the best way of achieving that is to get you to trust me a bit and think that I'm on your side. And really the only way of doing that is actually that trust has to be justified and I have to genuinely be on your side. And one of the things I've got is this honesty thing. So I will never say anything dishonest. I will not lie to you or try and trick anyone because I figure that costs a little bit more at the beginning and it's a bit of effort to run that. But once I've established that relationship, it actually helps me achieve my goal. So it's actually a bit ruthless because at the end of the game, I just want to achieve this goal, which is I want you to go out and be awesome and changed in various ways. I won't actually, maybe at the end of the course, I'll get you to think about what my actual objective in this course was, because I have a very precise one. And I, I do a thing when I'm going in to give any talk, which is the sub objective for that talk. I repeat in my head, just as I walk in, I call it the most important thing. So as I'm going in, I think, don't forget the most important thing today is blah, blah, blah. And then no matter how much things go off the rails and how much I forget and how distraction we go, going to get to blah, blah, blah. We're going to do blah, blah, blah. And this then now relates to your first point, Tom, which I think is a really interesting one. Oh, the second one's fine. The second one's good too. But um, the first point was be open to other things that are better. And I think in life, that's just a general good life lesson. Uh, don't be closed-minded. Always be open. And in communication, I would actually call that the skill of listening. So be very good at listening to what's going on and reading back, not just presenting ruthlessly and forgetting about what's going on and be prepared to change what you're doing. But I don't think you should change what you're doing. If you've got good goals, I don't think you should change what you're doing to change your goals. I think it's just sub goals that will change. So I have a certain mindset I want you to have at the end of the course. But if I'm giving the talk and someone doesn't like something and someone likes something else, I might change. Oh, we'll do something else this lecture. Or here's a better way of achieving that sub goals. I'm very open to all of that, but I'm not open to at the end of the course, you guys just learn some stuff, forget it all and go on and get a tick and get some marks and move on. I actually want you to be a little bit different in some way. Uh, and I'm not open to changing that as much, but I reckon I am pretty open. So I reckon you're right. If halfway through the course, circumstances change. What, who said that? Someone said that. It's a great quote. When, when facts change, ma'am, I change my opinions. What do you do? Who said, someone found some politician being inconsistent because something had changed. And he said, well, if things, who, it was Abraham Lincoln. We love Abraham Lincoln. He's so cool. So yeah, absolutely. You've got to be open. You've, you've got to live an examined life, as Socrates would say. You've got to constantly think about things and change as we go. So absolutely, Tom, I really like the um, principles behind what you're saying. But I hope you can also see that my goal is normally so high level that even the different taking different journeys and being open to that is I'm still doing it with this particular end goal in mind. Yeah. I, I think the, the high level part is the important part of that. And, yeah. e and even so, the other thing I'd say is, you know, your goal may be to change our minds at the end, at the end of the course. Um, but if for instance, a massive global pandemic came along and meant that some people weren't able to do that. And you, it's interesting because you said, you know, you'd do whatever it took to get that goal. Yes. I'm curious if you actually would do whatever it took to get that goal. I like you guys too much. I wouldn't do anything. Um, but um, but I, I just really do passionately believe in that goal, which is I want you, well, I'm not going to say it because I've set it as a challenge to you to work out what it is, but I will tell you at the end. Uh, and it's a goal that I think is in your interest. But yeah, I was thinking even as I was talking before, because I just heard my dad got sick again and had to rush back to hospital. You know, he'd had this heart operation. We thought everything was okay. And now he's going back to hospital and he's all stressed and mum's stressed and something wrong with his heart and everything's, yeah, thanks. Um, so you know, I nearly didn't give the lecture tonight because they needed me to drive up and pick him and drive him to hospital. But luckily my wife chucked her work in and, and raced off. So she's a quite senior in an organization that might have some problems tonight because she did that. But, um, uh, you know, and I guess I would, you know, got to be open to change. You've got to, you know, I have a higher goal even than helping you guys, which is probably helping my dad. Um, so yeah, 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 absolutely. Be reflective. I love that. Oh, you know, if you just do something because you've set your mind on doing it and you're not constantly evaluating it, then pff, yeah, you're right. That's great. Okay. So um, thank you. Uh, I, I'm sure I have this um, unjustified optimism in the world. Um, yeah. Great, but thank you. Um, so uh, uh, what have we got? Objective change. Yeah. You got to bring about change and attention. So now we're going to start looking at the lower level things. As Tom pointed out, this thing I mentioned first is a very high level thing. You wouldn't even notice if you didn't do it. But I think if you don't do it, then your talk and your teaching is just because it's just a mess. You know, you just, you've got an, you've got a goal, even if you don't know, it's just an accidental goal in there. And 
might as well have a deliberate selector. Um, Richard, can I ask a quick question? Go, oh, shoot. You keep using uh, communicate and teaching interchangeably. Well, it sounds interchangeably. Are you saying they are interchangeable or is there a difference between the two? That's a really good point. In my mind, um, in, because I of my whole life and thing, I think of them as the same. So I think all communication is like how I think all teaching is. But I, by the word teaching, this is just a little aside, so you could just tune out for a second if you're not interested. Um, by teaching, I don't think teaching is perhaps what other people might mean when they say the word. For me, teaching is effective communication that brings about change in the students. Um, and it's about changing students in ways that help them uh, and help the world, hopefully. So that involves communication. Uh, communication without, that's not teaching, for me is almost communication without change. But there is this patronizing connotation to teaching that there's this teacher who's somehow wiser and a student who's somehow less wise and one person is acting on the other in a sort of non-reciprocal way. And I don't think that's how teaching is. I really think in this course of uh, 400 of us or so that there's probably 401 teachers in here and 401 students because who I am is largely an amalgam of all the things all my students have taught me over the years, many of them very, very humbling lessons. Um, so I don't think of it as a power thing. So, uh, but yeah, I do, I do. It's a, almost a, like a Marxist approach, like this Marxist approach is things are only valid if they bring about change or effect in some way. And I sort of, while well, not being a Marxist, I don't think I'm a Marxist, I don't know. But um, uh, I do sort of like that idea that something that's just entirely abstract and has no impact on the world is, um, yeah, I don't know. So yeah, for me, they're the same, but you could review them as different things. Um, Sure. Yeah. I mean, I guess teaching is communication is a tool used by teachers and the act of teaching is probably act of goal selection. And then the communication is how you carry it out. And so probably you can tease out a little bit more distinction there. So I should stop being lazy with my words and be quite precise. So in communication, then, um, thanks, Joe. That was really good. In communication, um, you cannot, you can easily forget the first bit of working at the big goal and you can do a wonderful second bit, but it's, as I said, clangs and noise and, and symbols and emptiness because who knows what it's achieving. Um, and the example I want to give there uh, is the students that I was observing in this course that I was running. The ones that had a clear objective and gave a talk, it was a brilliant talk and it was moving and I felt it would have been effective and appropriate for that scenario. And the ones that just viewed the scenario as window dressing, and they just gave the same talk as if it had been at a funeral or trying to persuade a prime minister to change or on the Titanic trying to persuade this or, or trying to do this or, you know, if it, the context was irrelevant, then, um, and they just gave a funny talk or something, then, you know, uh, I just found those talks a bit of a mess. And I thought at the end of it, maybe people would have smiled and laughed, but at the end of it, you'd have, you've missed an opportunity to do something, I think. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, they were really good. That was good. And I'm, I'm even more impressed that you manage in my non-stop speaking to jam in interjections. Please keep doing that. And if you sort of interject, but I keep talking because I haven't quite heard you, your picture flips to the front anyway, and suddenly I see you and then I can see you're interjecting and I will put on the brakes and stop 200 meters down the road and reverse back slowly and you can talk. So please just jump in and talk. That's great. Um, I maybe have a small interjection. Interject. <laughs> um, I I, I understand that like in things like presentations and teaching and like lots of different communication examples, it's super important to have a goal. Yes. But I also wonder whether uh, there's definitely some situations where you're not trying to necessarily bring about any change. Like for example, giving the wake at someone's funeral, you're not trying to change anything. Uh, so uh, I was thinking of that. Um, so a wake or a, a best, um, Actually, I think a wake has an objective and the objective of the wake is to help people with their grieving, to acknowledge the person's, um, the, you know, um, uh, impact on the world, not for them, but for the people, you know, I think a speech at a wake is for the people who are at the wake, not for the dead person. And I think, um, I think it's this really emotional and hard time um, at a funeral and, in, and when someone you love has died. And if someone can, I found some talks at wakes to be very comforting and have helped me or made me think about the person in a different way. I remember my, at my grandfather's funeral, some of his, he was a teacher too. And some of, anyway, people spoke about his teaching and uh, that was very profound for me and uh, made me think about him in a good way. Um, 
and took away some of the sorrow because it made me focus on some of the good things that had happened. So I do think in a way you, you don't want to do change in this sort of patronizing way, but you want to help everyone grieve. You want to, you know, you have, you have, you do have objectives in a, in a wake. I think if you're giving a talk uh, of, of um, a successful talk at the wake would honor the person, would make the people feel that they were properly honored. If there's grieving widows would make them feel that their partner was loved or, or, or widowers, their, their wife was loved. Uh, it was important. It would give meaning to it a bit. If it all seems a bit meaningless, you know, help you find the meaning because everyone's life has had meaning in some way and changed other people and so on. So I did, what do you think of that, Lauren? I, I do think there is some meaning there. Yeah, I asked because I did one last year and I didn't sit down and think, here's my goal, you know, like, but I guess by knowing someone, you, um, you kind of into like, you put that in without really thinking about it, but you're not, I wasn't trying to bring about change. I did have objectives, but they weren't about, yeah, anything in the present situation. Yeah. What were your objectives, do you think? I think to honour the person. Um and yeah, I don't know. Like the other thing is that um, you're never sure like what people are going to actually take away from mm-hmm. any piece of communication you give. Like just take like literary analysis as one example. Like people draw up all kinds of um, all kinds of interpretations from the way you communicate. So I think even by having an objective, like you can try and achieve it, but I don't know how how successful you can be in ensuring people take that away i think that's they're both really good points and if i can i would like to say something about both of them because i think they're worthy of response um there's if i do it in reverse order again the literary criticism one's interesting um it's certainly the case i think that the words once said don't belong to the speaker they belong to the listener and the listener can take what they want from them um and i do know there's a form of art where meaning is sort of denied in a way uh, and it's entirely constructed in the listener and there's poems like the poems by Ern Malley you know those ones generated randomly from random words where listeners still got value from them and I know there's automatically generated music that has no rhyme or reason um, and uh, and people still get value from that so that's absolutely fine and um, yeah I mean I could be wrong but but my thought is the plays I like the most the books I like the most the music I like the most has this coherence and beauty to it and I don't have to accept it. And sometimes the things I love in it are there accidentally um, uh, because of just the nature of the person who did it or the culture they've come from or other things like that. But um, I just think when you're talking, uh, if you don't want to be random, it's good to have a goal. I, I, I guess I, yeah, maybe I'm a bit naive there. Not so postmodern. Um, Can I say something to that as well? Yeah, Tom, shoot. Um, I think if you're really cynical about it, everything has a goal or at least you can make everything have a goal but it's sometimes more that you don't want to to have a goal or that acknowledging that actually just feels a bit disingenuous like for instance i mean if you're if you're giving a a speech at a wake or something you know you might want you might not want to think about the fact that you have a goal there to, to help grieve and so forth you're just trying to take part in that collective experience and having this sort of notion of what it's supposed to be is a very sort of um, I don't know what the right word for it is, but it, it just feels wrong or it feels like you shouldn't do that almost. Yeah. Just, just, I hear what you're saying. And I, 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 I mean, I hear a similar message from Lauren that in some sense, uh, a sort of unexamined in the flow sort of thing might be an appropriate sort of communication. And maybe I'm just a too analytical a brain, but uh, just when, when I approach, I mean, I do like switching off and not being analytical. It is a pleasure. That's right. So perhaps in singing or something, there's no goal. But I do think um, Lauren's point about the wake is a well-constructed wake speech. I mean, a wake speech can go off the rail or can be wrong. You know, it can be about you rather than the other person. It can be um, it can be inappropriate in, in lots of ways, or it can just not give people the solace they need. And I think you probably know from the environmental pressures and having been to things before, you sort of know what the goals are, as Lauren said. And maybe you're following these goals without even reflecting on them. But I do think they should always, you know, for me as a, constr- a creator, I like, so here's, here's Richard's personal idea about how to communicate. Please communicate however you like. Um, absolutely. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, but I, I do find that when, when there is thought and order and planning put into something, that very beautiful and powerful things can be created that I don't sometimes see happening without flow. 
Um, and Lauren, I think you had something else you want to say. I can see you sort of twitching. Is that still good? Yeah. Uh, yep. Um, maybe just have a look at the, the chat. It's going crazy. Oh, it's fantastic. All right. I will, I will, I will have a look at the chat. Um, uh, look, if you had to think of something that almost has no um, goal or meaning, it's a best man speech, you know, they're pretty hard to, um, or, or uh, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, is, there a, is there normally a response? I'm so gendered here, aren't I? Is there an equivalent to a best man speech, a, a response from the, um, from the brides? I've never, I've only ever been a best man. But I'm sure there's a response from either person. So I shouldn't say Ben. Uh, best person, maybe. Because um, my best person was a woman, uh, not a man. Um, so in those speeches, it is hard to know what they want and what they should be. But I think even then, there is a little bit of a goal going on. So I would encourage you, especially when you're in security and you're a professional and you're having some sort of professional conversation, uh, either managing up or down, or dealing with your team or trying to bring about something that you are probably motivated in those circumstances by trying to bring about a change, even if you can't articulate it. And I'm encouraging you to articulate it up front, the high level one. And I'm just about to now talk about the low level ways of going about carrying out that high level goal, but still encouraging you, even though it seems disingenuous and insincere and all sorts of things to have a high level goal first. That's going to be my position. Ah, oh, so many, uh, someone's going nuts. I can see all these comments coming in. Um, here we go. It's happening. What? Someone's someone's typing an actual exploit in the comments. <laughs> um, okay. Here we go. Um, so, action things you can do to communicate effectively. One, these are like low level things. Notice that you can only impact someone and get into their head if they're listening and you've got their attention. And attention is this very tenuous thing. And you only get it for a short period of time. I'm sure I've lost everyone's attention now. It's a, it's a little joy you get of the first few minutes or first few seconds where you've got everyone's attention and it's a precious resource and you've got to use it. And you either keep the attention or you lose it. And as soon as you lose it, you've lost it. You can't, it's very hard to get back. So attention is a scarce resource. Assume then that you only have it for a brief period of time. I think research shows, if I remember, does anyone know this stats on this? When people go for jobs, job interviews, eye tracking indicates that people have made up their mind about whether they're going to appoint someone or not very, very quickly. Does anyone know how quickly people make that decision? Oh, there's Christy. Hey, Chris. Hey, Evan, you're going to say something? 30 yeah. seconds. Yeah, it's in seconds, I think. I think it's even less than second, 30 seconds. Um, oh, Tom, I can't see your full comment. I'm on the wrong screen. Have I seen it? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I got distracted by the comments and then that's really funny. Uh, so yeah, it is within seconds. So I think you, you only have a short window of opportunity. So make good use of that. Uh, and one thing I see uh, people doing in ineffective talks and maybe it's because you're taught to do this at school is it's constructed bottom up. Uh, so programmers know what I'm talking about here. An ineffective communication tends to start like this. Here's a bit, here's something else. 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 Oh, you can combine those things to get this. Combine those things I said before to get this. Combine the two things to get this. And then an hour later, da -da -da -da, ba -ba, the conclusion, the reason I was talking to you, I've finally reached the conclusion. It's like a surprise. I didn't want to tell you up front where we're going. And now we've got there. And you look around the room and there's like three people left. And they're amazed at this surprise conclusion you've got to. But of the 400 you started with, you've only got three left. So um, uh, effective communication when you got to fight for someone's attention and attention to scarce resources, put the most important thing first because you're going to lose them before you get to there. And don't write your things like it's a mis murder mystery and you're going to do a big reveal in the last paragraph. Do the big reveal in the first paragraph, then all the stuff that justifies it, and then do it again at the end because they'll have forgotten that again. So the idea is, and you'll see American comedians often follow this thing, tell them what you, you're going to say, then say it, and then tell them what you just said. But don't talk, 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 and then at the end tell them why you said all that stuff. Um, people love uh, stories. So if you're going to construct uh, a good talk, I would suggest you learn a lot about narrative and look at how stories work. 
Um, stories like having arcs, it's like they're like having character, they're like having emotion. People are addicted to stories. You know, I think we've had an oral story, uh, oral uh, storytelling tradition going back forever, and it's probably a really important part of why we have language. Um, stories just really appeal to us. And I mean, Jesus, all, all the sort of parables, it's a very effective way of teaching. It used to blow me away when I'd read the things he said. I think he's just telling stories. It's so much more interesting that he preached at me with lists of numbers and rules if he tells me a story about stuff. That's really cool. So um, I do think stories are powerful and learning about how to tell stories and how stories work is a great skill for any communicator. And then you should try and incorporate as much of that storytelling um, skill and craft into how you talk because i think our brains are sort of wired up to understand it i think i was reading recently is this right they found a was it a neanderthal or an early some early hominin cave paintings that look like their stories and look like there's like some there's just like this year i've seen it some ridiculously old evidence of early storytelling through cave paintings or some sort of painting that's been preserved so um Acronyms. Uh, oh, yeah, objective. So if you want, uh, the point of your communication is to get someone to say yes to something, like I've spoken at my local council trying to get them to change some piece of law or not pass a piece of law or do something else. Um, sometimes I, I speak in front of groups where I want them to decide to do something or to decide not to do something. Sometimes I speak at academic board. Once when the vice chancellor was new to the uni, he had a big public forum called a town hall and he was talking about all the things he wanted to do. And one of the things he wanted to do, I thought was not, not quite right. And I thought, oh, I'm only going to get, I'll put my hand up. There'll be a thousand people in there. If I'm lucky, I'll get picked. If I get picked, I'll lose everyone's attention in like three seconds and he'll have already made his mind up and he won't really be listening to what I'm going to say. And I thought, how can I be impactful here? And I thought, I've got to have a killer example that I can say in about three seconds. That's funny because humor just instantly adds to stickiness, but the example is so telling and so emotionally loaded that everyone's going to completely agree with the example. And it's going to be this really clear analogy with this thing. And it's going to be sticky and catchy in a way. So they'll go away from the talk and they'll still remember that example. And I, I planned that one little interjection that must have looked like I was just telling a joke and I'd randomly stuck my hand up. I must have put eight or nine hours into planning that little one 30 second thing I said, um, because it was so important. Um, so yeah, storytelling, very important, uh, work out how to be objective. Uh, now, if you want someone to say yes to something, you've got to make it easy for them to say yes. So you want to persuade your boss to change the company's funding policy so you can get more funding for cyber, or you want to persuade one other division to have some onerous new privacy requirement on them, or you want, to, you want someone to say yes, okay, we'll do that. You have to make it easy for them to say yes, because people are, um, tired and busy and distracted and they've got a million things to do. And if I told you, oh, there's this really good thing we could do, you could simultaneously think, oh, that'd be really good. I wish we could do that. And also think, that's a pain though. That's a lot of work. So I think we'll probably just stick with what we're doing. But I agree, Richard, that would have been a good idea if we'd done that. So that's your real danger if you've got a good idea. So how can you get someone to say yes and buy into the good idea? Well, I find you have to do a bit of work for them because if it looks like saying yes to you means they've got to do work, it's very hard for them to say yes. But if you've done all the work for them and there's nothing to do other than saying yes, then they're more likely to say yes. So I remember at council, we, there was, we were objecting to something. I think there were 20 or 30 objections from around the neighborhood to this one thing. Um, and the council patiently listened to all the objections. But when I gave my objection, I said, da, 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 and here's a good thing and here's a bad thing about it. But I think this is really important to change. And we could change it just by changing these three words here in the consent from this to that. And I hear some evidence that that would be good. And you know what happened? The council thanked everyone for coming. They acknowledged everything everyone said, but they went ahead and approved the whole thing anyway, but they made that three word change because it was easy. They say, oh, and we vote for that change. And they felt they'd done something and they listened to us a little bit. So you pre-digest it and you have the thing you want them to do ready. Um, do not go to someone and give them a yes, no question. We're saying yes is going to involve them. It's going to be difficult for them. Make it easy for them to say yes. All right. Acronyms. So, an acronym is when you say the letters for something. Why do people say acronyms? What do you guys think? Why would someone in a conversation say an acronym? Why would I say PKI? Oh, I can see Lauren's leaning forward. But other people talk too. Oh, Lauren, I'm not trying to stop you from leaning forward. Makes you sound fancy. 
it makes you sound fancy. Joe, you've said it. Oh. Look, and that was a really clever piece of communication. So it was a little bit funny. So if it had been wrong, you wouldn't have felt silly because we sort of would have all laughed and it was good. Uh, and it was also, you're putting yourself down a little bit when you're funny. So it's not this, uh, it's just a very, that was a really nice response and it was spot on and you said it in quirky words. It was just absolutely right. It makes you sound fancy. Yeah, it's, it's, it's simple. It's status signaling or competence signaling. I remember when I used to start teaching uh, computer, um, just computer programming ages ago you'd get these people in the class and then and before the first class, I'd just sit in the audience and listen while everyone was filing in because I was so young. I sort of looked like a student back then, but now. Uh, and someone would sit next to them and then just start sort of bragging and they'd brag by using these acronyms. And it'd be this like game for one of them to say something the other one didn't know. And as long as each knew what the other one was saying, it was like I could imagine two elks with enormous big horns sort of bashing against each other. Acronyms are a way of signaling that you know stuff. And if you don't know the acronym, you're locked out. So it's actually a bit of a group thing. It's like a sibboleth or however you pronounce it. Uh, you should look that up. It's really cool. Uh, so it, the idea is it's something that shows that you're in the group and for people outside the group, they can't hear it and they can't understand what you're saying and actually acts to keep them out. It's not helpful in any communication at all. Sometimes in documents, people use acronyms because it keeps it shorter. So you don't have to write so much, but actually here's a confusion. People often have this same confusion when they write a computer program. The objective of a computer program is not for it to be short. The objective of a computer program is for it to be awesome, which means it works, it's easy to modify, it's a joy to read, it's easy to you know, add extra functionality. If there's a mistake in it, it stands out. They're your objectives in running a program. No one ever said, make it short. And make it short is sometimes a consequence of meeting those objectives, but it's, it's not the driver. And it's the same in a, a sentence. So if it takes me a bit longer to say something, but when I say it, you understand what I mean? And I can say it a bit shorter, but you don't understand what I mean? Then it really wasn't, I mean, if you think about you, the speaker, and communication is all about your speaking, I guess it could look like it's a win. But if you think about the listener and their understanding, it's a loss. So I would almost never say an acronym. I mean, what's the point of it? It makes people sound stupid if they ask for it. Uh, and, and when you go to the public service, they speak in acronyms all the time. It's very, you should do this. This is a homework for you. Somehow go into the public service somehow, Zoom bomb a public service meeting and just listen to them talk and see how many acronyms they are. It is, it's simul simultaneously depressing and funny. Um, so a uh, communication tip number uh, 17, I think we're up to is uh, no acronyms, please. Now everything should have a beginning and middle and an end. So structure your talks and your presentation. So there's beginning, middle and end. The beginning sets things up, the middle does the stuff and the end summarizes it all. Make sure you have those three parts. Um, always, if you're trying to persuade someone, begin from agreement. So start from somewhere where you all agree. Don't start by talking about the problem you all have, start by here's this common ground we have, we all like this, we all want this to be a success. And there are some challenges with we do it this way, we could do it that way, but start from agreement. Don't use acronyms. Oh, I said acronyms twice. And some examples, I've got lots of examples here. Here are some just, because how I learn to communicate is by just copying and by, oh, and record yourself always and play it back later on and listen through other people's ears so you can see how good you are. And I used to also put spies in all my talks and lectures. Um, my sister-in-law used to do it or friends or former students, just get people to hide in the lecture. And I remember my sister-in-law used to do it when she was 14 or 15, when she was visiting Sydney. I'd just smuggle her into the back of lectures and at the end say, how did that go? What did you think? And then she would give me this completely, um, because you know she just said it like it was, she'd say, you know, you love the right side of the room and you never look at the left side of the room. I was on the left side of the room. I felt really lonely. And I said, I never even noticed that. So, so anyway, yeah, listen to yourself. Notice here are things you can do to work out how to communicate. There's this incredible book. I don't know if anyone's read it by Scott McLeod called Understanding Comic, where he, where he analyzes how comics communicate and tell stories. And he does it in terms of a comic. It's a graphic novel about how to understand graphic novels. It's just so beautiful. When you read that, it's humbling and it tells you all about storytelling. He's written another one called Making Comics. Comics, that's good too. Read the book When Friends and Influence People. That is an amazing book. It's nearly 100 years old now and it's still awesome. I only hope it doesn't get coronavirus. It is, um, who wrote it? Dale Carnegie wrote a couple of other books as well, but this is the killer one. Win Friends and Influence People. Sounds cynical and sarcastic, but it's actually really lovely. Um, and then I have a stack of books that I knocked on the floor. Let me now do a show and tell as we approach our first break. So you can relax now. I'm just going to show you some books that I think are really good examples of communication. Oh, and there's one bad communication. Richard, have you seen Utopia? Oh, Utopia. No more Richard. 
she's very funny you say that it sounds like so, I can't, yeah it's brilliant and that um are you able to share screens oliver or is it just um i can try but i don't know what you want me to share it, um i'm going to show this i want to show this video that you might have seen already it's called something the change makers or something like that it's almost it could have been taken out of utopia it's an an advertisement made by the public service encouraging people to come and work in the public service it is i think the classic example of the didn't ample of the worst communication ever invented if you could find that we'll show it in a few minutes but if you can't that's fine All right here we are here are my examples of good communication so let's just start here All right best this book here oh it's so it's got a bit battered um this is an awesome book, Good Alicia Bark and Eternal Golden Braid. It, it tries to explain something that's almost completely incomprehensible. You really, it's advanced, um, it's, well, it's Gödel's Incompleteness Theorem. So it's, it's formal logic and it's quite advanced formal logic. Uh, yet this book can be written by, read by a teenager. Don't read the first chapter, the introduction, that's a little bit depressing and hard. Skip over that straight into the book. The book itself could be read by anyone. And at the end of it, accidentally, you've learned Gödel's Incompleteness Theorem. Uh, and along the way, you've learned all about uh, Escher, MC Escher. You've read all these funny stories. You've played games. You've just been in, enticed and enhanced and, and entertained. You don't realize you're learning and you get to the end, you know the whole thing. Everything I do in my teaching is copied and stolen from this brilliant man who's such a great communicator. He makes learning fun and you don't even notice you're doing it. I love it so much. So that's a great example of good communication. Uh, I'm inspired by that. Um, here, this book here, A Little History of the World written by this German guy. It's amazing. He wrote, it's just a summary of history. It misses out all sorts of things. Um, it's very Anglo-centric or Western-centric. Um, but it's just brilliant. And you read this and you understand a whole lot of history that you never understood before. And he wrote it essentially for 10-year-olds. So it's written for 10-year-olds. It's written, it's so clear. It's just amazing. It blows me away as a piece of clear communication. Has anyone actually read this or seen this book before? No, oh, you're so lucky. You should get a copy. You can knock it over in like 10 seconds and you'll know all this stuff and you'll understand the history of the world. Um, and the reason, because it was so good, a lot of people have copied it. There's lots of books that spring up like this. Instead of a little history of the world, a little history of science. This is a terrible book. Oh, Joanne. Did you have something you wanted to say? No, that's fine. If you do come back, that's fine. Um, yeah, a little history of science. So he sort of copied the cover and the title and his copies of format inside, but he doesn't copy the communication style. So reading these two books side by side makes it really clear what, what's going on in terms of good and bad communication. They look so similar. And there's lots of, there's lots of little history books. Uh, I haven't seen another one that's a patch on this original one. Um, Stephen uh, Hawking wrote A Brief History of Time and that sort of reminds me, similar sort of concept, but Stephen Hawking is a really good writer. So he sort of, I think he did it successfully. That's right. Stephen Hawking, Carl Sagan, there are, we do, we've been blessed with communicators. That, okay, that's right. That's absolutely right. Thank you. Um, this is the best graduation speech ever given. It's called Greg, Congratulations, by the way. Luckily, someone recorded it and wrote it down. It's tiny. You can just read it on the internet, it's free. But I got the book because it's such a good book. You can give it to anyone as a Christmas present and they'll be happy forever. It is literally the best speech ever. I uh, sometimes, often I was gonna say, I sometimes am asked to give graduation addresses at institutions. And when I do, I, well now I actually find it hard to give them because I think, well, the best one in the world's already been given. What can I give? Just a power reflection on that. But uh, that's another time where I do a big analysis of what are my objectives at a graduation speech. And over the years I've slightly tweaked what the objectives are. Maybe I'll put some of my graduation speeches up and you can look at them if you want to just see and try and double guess what I'm trying to achieve in them. But this one here, best one ever, you can read it in 10 seconds, available online for free. He later on went to be a famous author. He wrote Lincoln in the Nevada. But uh, at the time he wrote this, he was just a guy. Um, the Little Prince, of course, um, by this pilot who I love more than anything, who's written all sorts of amazing books and they're so beautiful. So Little Prince is a great example. Good communication. This book here, I told you to read it in the first week. I hope you've all read it. This is the edition I like the most. I think this is the second edition. There's a big edition that's come out, but this is Little. You see, I like Little and it's short and concise and it's just beautiful and it will help you be a great communicator, a written communicator, but the ideas in it will also help you in your verbal communication. Um, 
it's persuasive as well. So after reading it, not only do you have the techniques to be a good communicator, but you really want to be. So, and I find win friends and influence people is a bit like that too. Um, this book here, Uka the Wise, I bought this from the States in hard copy. It's an old library copy. You can't get it for love or money. I can't even remember how much it cost me. It was a fortune. Um, it's out of print. It is the most amazing book ever. I might read you a story from it one day. It's just so beautiful. Um, it's a Japanese, um, essentially Solomon type story telling uh, the wisdom of a judge in Japan. Um, it's a story for judges, really. Uh, and then novels. What novels are well communicated? Well, you'll all have your own ideas, but I find John le Carre communicates really well. And I find Patrick O'Brien communicates really well. And I find Greg Egan communicates really well. And I find Ursula Le Guin amazing, especially these really early books she wrote that are so short. I can't believe you read this book. It's like reading a poem. You've read 17 pages or how long it is at the end. Your whole world is filled with the universe, big in Star Wars. And I went through once and did an analysis of how she wrote and how each chapter relates to each other chapter. And also the structuring is brilliant. So it is possible to communicate well, and it's possible to do a mess. And if you pick up a random book, I find often it's just a mess. But these, I think each of the things I put up then was very carefully planned. And maybe as Laura and Tom pointed out, that's just my bias and I like centralized planning and, and things, but they are quite beautiful. All right. So they're my written examples and spoken. If you want to learn how to give a good speech, I always think you should steal from other people. It's very hard to work things out for yourself. So I copy other people. So when I started talking, I just made a mission of going through and listening to the great speeches from history to try and think about how they were constructed and put together and what their objectives were. And here are some of them. I wrote a list of my favorite ones down here. Where are they? The Sermon on the Mount, I think is amazing. It's amazing. I, I, I like the values in it, actually. Yeah, I'm doing a lot of Christian stuff, aren't I? I? If I knew other religions, I'd talk about them too. I'm sure they've got great speeches. Um, but the Sermon on the Ground is just, the Mount is really well constructed and it's really quite persuasive and it's really simple and he's addressing his audience really effectively. It is a brilliant piece of oration, I think, as well as I quite like the values in it. The Gettysburg Address. So that's the talk that Lincoln gave um, at the memorial service, Gettysburg. Um, he was a president he wasn't even supposed to give the talk. I think I can't remember all the details, but it goes something like, I think there was, there's some Republican or whoever it was, the two sides. He was not a Democrat. He was the other one. I don't know if they were the Republicans or called something else. And he, um, there was some squabbling between them and, and for some reason he wasn't coming. I think now people say he wasn't invited because they thought he wouldn't come. But anyway, there was some hoo-ha and they invited someone else to give the talk the, to commemorate the, the battle at Gettysburg. Um, so many dead people. It's almost like a wake speech, Lauren. It's that sort of, sort of thing we were talking about before. I hadn't thought of that before. Anyway, the official speaker came first and um, spoke for two hours. And then Lincoln stood up and said like 10 sentences. I don't know how many I should have counted. Like nothing. Like it was just a couple of minutes. Um, and it was the most amazing speech. It's unbelievable. There's this myth that went around for a while that he wrote it on the train while he was coming in. But um, evidence seems to suggest that's not the case. And I think it's not the case because I've given lots of speeches. And when you see something small and beautiful, it's because someone's taken something big and horrible and put a lot of time into it to make it small and beautiful. It is a lovely speech. Um, I would read through that and analyze that. And that inspired me a lot in my early days about just how to give a speech. Elements of um, flow, of relationship, of linking, of closing, uh, call outs at the beginning and end linking together. Um, just all the structure of it is just really beautiful. So you should read it and think about why it's so great. The two hour one, pff, who remembers that? The short one, amazing blew us all away. He wasn't giving that speech for the people there. He was giving that speech for the whole country. He was giving that speech. It was a good speech when it was printed in the papers later. It wasn't necessarily a good speech on the day. No one could hear it. You know, no one's paying attention for respect. They wanted another two hour talk then they got a 10 second one, you know, so, but he wasn't, he was thinking, I want to do something that's going to actually change the nation. And it did an amazing talk, the Gettysburg address. Um, what else have we got? The, I have a dream speech. Um, Socrates' apology. Socrates, I love Socrates. 
Um, Socrates' apology is a great speech. Just, you know, everything Socrates, well, we don't know what he said. We only know what his students wrote down about what he said. That man never published. He'd never survive in a university today. But uh, what an amazing man. So, yeah, you might want to read the apology. Churchill gave all these incredible speeches. And, of course, we're thinking about them now um, as we go into the COVID situation. Um, uh, so, yeah, pick your favourite Churchill speeches and listen to them. Because he had a mission. In every one of the speeches he gave, there was a reason for giving it, and he had an objective, and he achieved it. And they weren't manipulative objectives. They were, I mean, he was working for a noble cause. Gandhi's do or die speech is amazing. Gandhi's amazing. Um, all right. There's lots of other ones. Uh, even the one small step for mankind. That's pretty good. So look at the things that have been effective communications for you. Look at how people do it and then try and copy them. You will not ever communicate well just by accident or by just throwing things together because it seems to work. It needs a lot of planning. There's a famous um, quote that someone said, it might've been Oscar Wilde or someone else. I was going to write you a short letter, but I didn't have time. So here's a long one instead. The idea being to make something concise, structured, planned, and well-organized to have a good communication that takes a lot of time and effort and planning. Okay. Um, how did you go, Oliver? Did you find it? I found something, but I'm really not sure if it's a piss take or not. <laughs> it's like so ridiculous. Yes, that's it. <laughs> they paid money for this. That's it. That's the perfect description of it. It's, I'm just about to go flat, so I'm just going to plug my thing in. It's a, a piece of communication that's so bad, you can't actually believe it was made. Are you able to share your screen? I'll have a go, yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah, one sec. I joined a little late. Uh, what's this horrible speech? Um, oh, we're just about to see an example of poor communication. And this is a, um, I'll tell you at the end, but it's a real ad put out by the public service. Can you see this? Uh, it's come up on my screen. Has it come up on everyone else's? The game changes? Yeah. yeah. Game changes. Oh, you guys, you got to watch this. Go, go, go. So stoked for our presentation to the executive this afternoon. It's been a massive challenge, but definitely looking forward to it. Hey guys, I'm just heading downstairs to my paleo pear and banana bread. Would you like to join me? <laughs> no thanks, it's a little bit fancy for me. I'm actually off to an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander stuff network meeting. Okay then, see you. So how are you finding the program? It's pretty great to be honest. I've been here less than a year and I never thought that I'd be working on a project supporting the modernisation program across government. Awesome. I'm working on a project in property and construction. Hey, are you going for the Young Leaders Network dinner tonight? Yeah, wouldn't miss it. The last one was great. Hey, Claire. Hi, David. I had a look at your report yesterday. Great stuff. Thanks. We are all really looking forward to the great presentation this Arvo. <laughs> thanks, David. No pressure or anything. Hey, Rita, I got this for you. Oh, thanks, David. Hey, this year's grads are real game changers. I've heard some fantastic reports about their work. They've certainly hit the ground running. Well, actually, I should say sprinting. I've got two graduates working on projects in my division, and they've just had such a great impact on the team. It's terrific. It's really great that we can talk to executives like that. Yeah, totally. Hey, Eddie. Hey, guys. I feel really good about my part of the presentation with the executive this afternoon. There were heaps of good stuff on e-learning, which really helped me. Hey, buddy. Sorry, I got to do that every time. It's because we're in the buddy program. Have you had a run through of all the other grads? Yeah, we had one yesterday at lunchtime. Tom couldn't make it, so we just Skyped him in. But it all seems to be coming together now. Great, can't wait to hear all about it. Good luck, buddy. See ya. Hi, guys. Hi, Hi Tina. Tina. So, a few finalising your presentation. Yep, nearly there. Looking forward to it. Me too. Hey, Dane, you mentor Jenna, don't you? I do, yes. Yep. I think her capabilities would be a really good match with Budget Surge team. Can you suss her out and see if she's interested? Sure, I'm actually seeing her this afternoon, so I'll definitely rather pass her. Great, thanks. See ya. Hey, Jenna, I just had a quick chat to Tina and she asked me if you would be interested in joining the Budget Surge team. What do you think? Oh, yeah, that'd be brilliant. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see you all this afternoon. 
We've had lots of positive feedback about your work across the different projects. From my first look, I can see that you've built many of the skills that I know will stand you in good stead for future opportunities, whether here in finance or elsewhere in the APS. Many of the ideas you've come up with are real game changers. With that in mind, we at the board are looking forward to seeing your detailed presentations. What do you guys think? Word salad. That's all I'll say. <laughs> does, does it make you want to go and work in the public service? I mean, you could really be a game changer. You could. That sounds like a great way to make 80K a year and get absolutely nothing done. And I think that's my, my sort of fit, you know? <laughs> they didn't actually show any game changing. Why do they do? They don't do anything. Oh, there's such parasites. That's right. The highest um, goal they got was they got to meet executives. <laughs> it's just, oh, look, I wrote down bits there. Uh, uh, there's paleo pear and banana bread. We've definitely got to have that in this course. Someone said, I think her capability would be a really good match. I think your capability would be a really good match with something. That's, I'm going to say that to you. That's going to be my feedback for something you hand in or on your exam or something like that. Oh dear. It's very, very funny. Oh, and I, she certainly hit the ground running. Uh, I should say sprinting. Um, so what's funny about that communication? Well, what was its purpose? I don't, I don't think anyone articulated the purpose. If the purpose was to get smart people to come and work for the Department of Finance, um, then obviously it's a complete failure because no one smart watching that would want to work there. You just think, well, I'm wasting my life. I'm not doing anything real. I'm just walking around seeing executives all day. You know, I'm not actually making the world better in any way. So I don't think that was its purpose. I think the purpose of it was, you know, it was just clearly to make the executive look good and feel good. The secretary of the department got to appear in it. Some high up lady got to appear in it. You know, they got to talk about how awesome they were and how they had Ab Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders there. And they were just sort of virtue signaling. And it's just like, you know, it was just, uh, you know, it would have been something the ad agencies showed the firm, the organisation, and the organisation would have felt good about themselves. But the point of the communication was to get other people to join the organisation. I just think it was a complete failure. Um, but, yeah, it's too good to be a parody. It's actually better than Utopia even, I think. What do you reckon? Who, who Utopia? Was that Chandler? Someone mentioned I, I feel like what happened was that, like, this ad agency came up and, like, we should do, we should do an ad and then everyone was like, oh, yeah, let's all be in this, like, fun video that we can all make. And then, they, like, it was just, like, very badly scripted. Yeah. Yeah, no one ever thought, what are we trying to do with this? So, yeah, it was fun to make. I think that's right. It, the script, I mean, it was just all awful. Um, it was truly. Did anyone think it was, um, does anyone have anything to say about it? What it tells us about communication? At least I think it, case, I guess, um, the less you say, the better. I think it's done a good job. I mean, people are talking about the Department of Finance more than they would have without that ad. <laughs> that's right. That's right. It was, it's, it's actually a warning. It's like a cattle grid. It's like um, sometimes people say this with spam, uh, not spam, with um, bad social engineering emails, like mass phishing emails. They're badly written and they've got bad grammar and they're just so obviously a scam. And it serves to stop smart people from replying to the scam people. So only complete, it's a filtering process. I think of it as like a cattle grid, you know, cattle grids are things that only the cattle can walk, the cattle can't walk across it, but cars can drive across it and people can. So cattle grids stop cattle, but not anyone else. And this ad maybe is a cattle grid for um, the sort of people they don't want to come along. Uh, or maybe it was put in by a good person to keep you guys out, to keep my students out of there. Um, maybe I made that ad. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just not a lot of thought. Anyway. In the in the comment, so the, the description of the video, there was a link to the Sydney Morning Herald or whoever would publish that, basically saying like experts react to this um, ad. Yes. And they must have done a, an article at some point on it and absolutely ripped into it because yeah, it was. That's it awesome. wasn't even that. I didn't even find that on the government page. I found that on like Sydney Morning Herald or whoever it was. 
you can bet this has been buried. This is like ScoMo's um, original uh, Lara Bingalad. I'm sure <laughs> no one, no one that made it wants to admit it was made. But uh, yeah, you can bet it'll never die. Uh, Oliver, would you mind just posting the precise URL you use for that version of it in the notes? Um, because I'd like to go down and hunt for that article. See, because it'd be really interesting to read an analysis from someone who's analyzed it properly. Yeah, so in the, I'll, I'll try and put it in the notes, but I just found the, just click to the article and the title is This Hilarious Federal Department, This Hilarious, yeah, Federal Department of Finance video may be the worst uh, ad. So, pretty good. Um, Maybe it was all an elaborate plan and they were actually making it so bad so that it would get so much media coverage and have so many people watch it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Maybe, maybe it was made by the New Zealand Department of Finance. Maybe it's a false flag operation. <laughs> Hard to know. Okay, um, yes, yes, yes. There could be all sorts of Machiavellian things going on. But they do say never put down to uh, conspiracy things that can be put down to stupidity. Uh, the last thing I wanted to say, uh, I just had two little funny examples. What was that? Oh, that one was. Oh, this was a two Ronnie skit. Oh, yeah. So there's a YouTube link there. Uh, if you go to it, it's a two Ronnie skit about, and uh, it's a communication one. And what I, um, I'm just trying to now do the call out at the end. So we've reached the end and I'm now referring to the thing I mentioned at the beginning because that was the most important thing, which is don't forget that to communicate effectively, you need to think about the mind of the person hearing it, not about yourself. Um, so in this two Ronnie's one, you see how one person's saying something and the other person's hearing something else. It's very funny and clever because they're always very verbally really clever. And then there's the poem with air tune. Does anyone know this poem? Very famous one by the guy who did Let's Talk Strine. It's making fun of the Australian accent, made by an Australian, of course. It's a poem and it has a different meaning to the speaker and the hearer or to the reader and the author. Can anyone read what the first line actually says? The title of the poem is With Air Chew. Can Without anyone? you? Yes. With air chew, with air chew. I can hardly live in air chew. <laughs> I can hardly live there, there chew. I can hardly live uh, there chew. I can hardly live uh, there chew. I can hardly live without you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See if you can read it. And I dream of Badger Kish's Snight and Darling. <laughs> it's very funny so yes communication uh is about what the person hears not about what you say okay uh now i wanted to talk about the job application so i've put a link on the side to the job application um can i share my screen i might just share the screen so you can see it here we go uh, are you able to see the screen everyone oh this is heaps better now i get to see a whole lot of people's faces Oh, thank you everyone for putting your cameras on. That's really cool. Oh, Richard. Yeah. If you right click, you can like press show video participants only. Ah, oh, how do I right click what? On, on like all the, on all the webcams. Uh, my co-host, I can't see it. But I will try that later on. But at the moment I can see everyone. Cool. Which is just amazing. So that would be what a right click would give me normally. Yes. That's amazing. All right. It's really nice to see you. All I guys. think if you click on the three little dots on anyone's image, one of the options is show video only. Uh, Hide non video participants. Yeah. It's got to be a non video participant though. You can't click on anyone that your webcams on. Yeah. Yeah. I see that. Okay. That's really good. Thanks guys. This is really helpful. Thanks. Guys. Um, Okay, job application. So can you just nod? Because I can see nods instantly. Can you see the web? Am I showing the web page? Yep, thanks guys. So um, let's go, where is it? It's hiding at the top. So you've all been working on the job application and we've, um, you know, we've gone through crazy times. So I just thought I'd tell you what we're looking for is you now reach last week or two of a thing and you've got to write the damn thing up. So what to do? can write a job application with five brief pages, four pages and one page. And it's got all the evidence you've been keeping throughout the term and all the things you've done. Uh, and you can read about this yourself. I just wanted to go down the different areas. So what you've got to do basically, I think we said this earlier on, um, is you've 
we want to see evidence. We want you to make a claim. You're going for this job. So there's an actual ad. You can click and get to the actual ad. Not that it's relevant, but I just put it in. Here's the actual ad, which I stole from words from other ads and reassembled them. It's a, for a company called Gitson, and it's what they're looking for. And these are all words from real ads I just assembled into one. Uh, oh, um, mo most of it was based on a Google ad. There you go. Um, <clears throat> so let's go. You don't need to read that, but it's fun. Just so you realize this is actually what people are looking for when they hire people, all the stuff that you're going to write now in your job application. So you're going to write an application or you could call it a portfolio, which is five pages, one page for each of five things. And each of those pages is just going to summarize one area. And the area are the things that they said they're looking for in the job ad. So the five things were, uh, bum, bum, bum. relevant technical skills. So let's go through them one at a time and just talk about what we're looking. So for relevant technical skills, you've just got to talk about the skills you've got, what you've got, what you can do, what you know. And then you talk about that a little bit and then all your claims are demonstrated by evidence. So you could say, I've learned how to do this as evidence. Here's a project I did in a photograph of it, or I'm good at this. I learned how to crack these codes as evidence. Here's my um, getting all these activities are done in open learning that test those codes. Um, I know about this. I've got this technical skill. Here's someone commenting on it, or here's a, um, <clears throat> here's a lightning presentation I did on it, or here's a blog where I reflect on it or something like that. So just make claims about what technical skills you've acquired in the course and then give evidence demonstrating that you have acquired those skills. Second thing they're looking for is that you've got a security mindset. So it's about how you think, how you approach life, how you approach the world. It's mainly about having security eyes and being analytic all the time. So what are we looking for? Blah, 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 blah. Mentioning all the evidence you can do. You can say stuff about your blogs, say stuff about this. It's quite long because I'm giving lots of things you could do. I'm not expecting you're going to do all these things. I'm expecting you're going to have one page, which is called security mindset. And you're going to make a couple of claims about why you think you've got a security mindset and in what ways you think you've got a security mindset. And then for each of those claims, you're going to say, for example, this, I talked about this. For example, I blogged about this. For example, I learned this and did this project. Here's a picture of it. Link to it. So you, your page will just be a summary of if you were going for the job and you knew they wanted someone with the technical skills, how, what would you tell them? They say, well, sit down, come in. We think your capabilities might be a good match for this role. Can you tell us about your technical skills? And then they all sit back with arms crossed waiting for you to talk. What are you going to say? Well, hopefully you say, oh, I can do this and I can do that. And I know a little bit of crypto and I learn how to do this and I know how to do this. And here are my five areas. And then for each of them, you give some sort of example of how come you're good at that area or something you've done in that area. Because no one ever wants to hear you talk. And so you something there's a question and they say, what do they claim to have done? Then what's the evidence of it? And then what's the impact of what they've done? So if you just talk about all the things you've done, you fill up the first column and the other two are blank and you're just, because we want all the columns filled up. So we want someone to talk about what they've, you know, the skills they've got. And then the middle column is they talk about all the things they've done with that, proving that they have it, evidence that they do, that they're not just making it up. And then in the last one, some sort of demonstration that you've got impact and you've used it well and, and it's had a big impact, influence on what it's led to and so on and so on and so on. Because when you employ people, you only want people who are going to bring about change. So you always ask, you know, so, so dot, 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 what have you done with it? What's happened with it? How do we know? Um, so that's your um, security mindset. So that's anything you've noticed, anything, stuff you've posted in security everywhere, uh, how you've reflected in your blog about how you've changed, new things you've noticed, anything you've done that demonstrates your security mindset. So if I said, hey, tell me about that you've got a security mindset, you could say, sure, yeah, I love security. I've built all these projects and whenever I walk around, I just notice security flaws. Here's something funny I noticed at the bank the other day. Uh, and then sometimes when I notice things, I report it to the people and they change it. Here's some suggestions I made for how someone can change something. Here's an email that they mail back saying that they have changed it. And, Blah, 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 blah. So whatever you want, you don't have to do it all. Otherwise it'd be a nightmare. You've just got to do something and then support it with some evidence. If you do one thing, woohoo, that's good. If you can find three or four, that's fantastic. Okay. Um, working with others. So we need you to be able to work with others. So we need you to have good teamwork, good communication skills. Uh, we say community building there. That's a mistake, isn't it? Because there's a whole category for community building further on, I think. 
um, professional skills that you do ethical behavior. So talk about how you've worked with other people, how you've done teams, how you've, um, how you've, uh, yeah, how you've worked with others, all the different ways you've worked with others in this course or in general over this period of time. Um, and then another thing we want in this same category of your, what's this, working with others ability, working with others, where am I? I'm a bit confused here. Oh no, that's just working with others. That is a community thing. And then self-management, that's the next one. So proving you can manage yourself and make things happen and organize things. You're not a shambolic mess like me. Um, so showing you've got good time management skills that you engage in professional and ethical behavior. And here's a talk of, here's a list of some of the things you might want to show for that. Do you have, um, have you delivered and planned successfully uh, projects? That's the last one. You're something awesome. So yeah, the last thing in the criteria was show that you've actually can carry out some sort of project and you've done something impressive. So here you talk about your security everywhere. You say what you did, um, that you carried it off, the problems you had, how you overcame them and how you still managed to get something. Now I should say, I've talked, been chatting with a couple of people about their security everywhere. Uh, there's something awesome. No one's going to actually achieve what they wanted to achieve. Or if you did, you, maybe your goals weren't ambitious enough. I mean, you're going to be a little bit disappointed in yourself and um, that's awesome because that means you're ambitious and you, your reach and your grasp don't exactly line up and that's fine. Uh, and I, I like that. And that's going to be the rest of your life. Probably you're seeing a pattern of that and that's absolutely okay. You just got to learn how to deal with that. So make sure you don't end up with nothing. Although you don't achieve everything you wanted, make sure you end up with something, work out some sort of minimum fallback thing you end up with and then make sure there's reflection about what went wrong and how you can fix it. And ideally the reflection doesn't all just happen at the end. Hopefully you've been grappling with this for a while uh, and just show that you've thought about it and just talk about the good things you have done and talk about how you do things differently if you do them again. And that's pretty awesome. I think you, most people can be quite hard on themselves with the something awesome. It's awesome if you've set out to do something ambitious and it's awesome if you've achieved something ambitious and you don't have to achieve every single ambitious thing you set out to do. Even just achieving one, teaching yourself one new thing and building one thing that worked a little bit. Well, that's impressive. Wow, much better than someone just sat around doing nothing. That's actually a little bit awesome. So well done. That's the sort of- Do we awesome get work. marks for um, delivery method? Like let's say like we didn't, probably didn't achieve like all of our criteria. So like it's, HD. Would we get some marks for a good presentation? Yeah, you'll get, um, so the mark, I'll talk about the marking in a sec, but yeah, it's not an all or nothing. You get marks for whatever you've done. Um, so the, if your presentation is good, then that goes towards your communication skills, which is one part of the portfolio. Um, for the something awesome, we're looking at, we're trying to find out what you actually did that was awesome. Um, uh, but if it didn't work and you did, um, recovery or some fallback strategy that that's awesome too. And you'd also mentioned that in your portfolio for project time management. Um, do, you, do you want me to show you the actual marking? Something awesome, something awesome. What we want to see. Oh, and then I listed things. I tried to give examples of things you could put for each category. I'm not trying to give you more work here. I'm just trying to make suggestions of things you could put in that might help you. So here's the things we'd like to see in each category. Here's nice things. Um, but you don't have to have them all. I don't want you to view this as a series of obligations on you. I want you to view this as, uh, oh my God, I have no idea what to write for the self-management section. It's so stressful. And then, oh no, here's some things I could write. So view it as a help. And you don't have to do it. If you can think of other ways of showing you're good at self-management, then don't do these things. That's all fine. Um, so the marking, let's just go down to that. Here's how, just different ways you can talk about all the different things. Uh, I'll talk about what's deliverable for this. No, let me say it now before I get to the marking. So for the something awesome, all you got to do is your video. You make a little two minute video demonstrating what your project was and you hand in a poster, which is one page A4 um, summarizing what you've done. You can put appendixes on as well. Um, you submit them to your tutor and that's due first. I think that's due. When is that due? Um, what's the marking? Is there something awesome due? I think it's June. The something awesome was due the day before the tutorial. That's what we agreed on the, on the tutors. tutors I think meeting. we did it the day before the In first tutorial, so people would later tutorial. Yeah, day. that's yeah. It's the Tuesday next week. Is that right? First tutorial is Wednesday. Yes. Yeah. So due Tuesday next week. Um, Wait, so is everyone's due Tuesday next week? Yeah, I think that makes it more fair. Um, the tutors might have a little bit of leeway, but yeah, it should be 
everybody in the cohort due at the same time. So that'd be Tuesday next week. With respect, um, if you've told us differently, and I seem to recall that we were told differently, that's who, a who, little bit not great. So who told you that and what were you told? Uh, I was so I was under the impression, and I may be wrong about this, but I remember being told it was due before your tutorial, in which case... That would be unusual because we had a tutor meeting about it at the start of the term before. Okay. Term maybe, I'm, maybe I'm remembering wrong. That's yeah, no, that's I don't have it in writing, so... I think that's how it was last year, and we were all very unhappy with it last year. So we decided this year it would be the day before the weekend. Right, okay. um, my uh, understanding and, was that we would present it in the tutorial. Is that yeah. not the case? No, that's so, fine. So, yeah, but you, you, um, sorry, Chris, you must say something. I was just going to, so there's not going to be enough time in one tutorial to go through all the stuff that we need to in terms of course content and the case study and uh, people's presentations. So they'll probably overlap two weeks, but we don't want somebody who goes in the second week to get a week extra than somebody who goes in the first. So everything needs to be due before people start pre presenting. Yeah. So just make a little video. <laughs> idea. Um, you don't want to do a live presentation or um, it'll just have all sorts of nightmares and problems. So just do a live presentation, just record it yourself. Like just beforehand. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. So um, what we're presenting in the shoot is just our pre-recorded video. Uh, yeah, we'll talk to your tutor. They might be happy for you to also do a different thing if you want, but I'm thinking people just do their pre-recorded video. What do you think, Chris? The pre-recorded video is all we need. If anyone wanted to do a different thing, we could do that as well. Um, I'll, ha I'll have a chat to Lockie and get some clarification and there'll be an announcement made tomorrow. Okay, fine. But yeah, I, um, if your tutor's happy for you to do other things as well, that's fine. But um, the video and the report um, I think, I think, I'm just thinking about it myself now, Chris. I don't mind if people don't want to, if people want to present something in the tutor itself, I'm happy with that because that's a bit more interesting. So as long as they've handed in the video the day before, you know, and the due date. Yeah, so that's how, we, that's how we did it last year. We had people handing in a video and that way you basically got the option to make something pre-recorded or... Um, yeah, so something was a bit pre-recorded and a bit more structured and you could think about your content or if it was just something like a hardware demo, you could do it in person, live. That way, when people ask questions, um, you can bounce it off and show your understanding a bit more than what you could in a pre-recorded video. I've got to say I like that more because for me, the best thing about the Something Awesome is it's just this beautiful time to stand up and just show all the things. And I know the last week before it's you you come out of it and most people pass and actually end up in quite a beautiful place. Uh, it is a really moving time. So I'd be very happy to have people talking and asking questions. That's just for fair fairness of marking. Um, uh, we, we should get the videos the day before, but they don't have to be anything fancy. Just how long is, I can't remember how long they were. Were they three minute video? Two or three minutes. Two or three. Yeah. That's right. Two or three minutes. Um, so yeah, so, just some, just to um, clarify, we're handing in a, two minute video and a one page report as our something awesome. And then talk what about if, it in the class. What if and our something you... awesome is not like a one page report sort of thing? What if it's like a book, for example? No, that's awesome. So yeah, you can link to the actual thing. That's absolutely fine. And we will read it with joy and delight, but make a one page summary, like opposed to the presentation so people know what it's about. And then people can then click through from links from that to whatever you want to show. And but do we definitely have to make a video um, if we want to present in the, like in live? Uh, uh, you should hand something in. It could be audio only. Are you talking about on your face? You could just, it could just be, um, you have, it's, for fairness, I do think it's important that everyone hands something in at the same time because some people won't be presenting for another week. And that's just... So the, the way that I see it is that the video is the thing that you should be submitting. And then because it's only three minutes long, a lot of people can't get all of their content in, uh, in three yeah. minutes. So in a presentation, in your tutorial, you sort of just say, these are the cool things. Um, here's the video that I've got. Uh, watch it later. But if anybody's got any questions related to my project, um, 
it can show your it will demonstrate your understanding better if you're able to answer questions that people have got. So you sort of spend two or three minutes talking in the tutorial about the stuff that you've, you've done over the term to, to show that you understand what you're talking about and you haven't gone and ripped the CTF solutions off some online and then done a video on those solutions. Yeah. And here's a crazy thing. And this is just by, flying by the seat of my pants. I wouldn't mind if the people that presented in the first week didn't do the video and just the people that presented in the second week did the video. You think of that, Chris, you're looking horrified. But that, that would be okay. And you could let people choose whether they want to go in first or second week. I don't want to make any decisions right now in the lecture. Um, I think what it people, might be cutting it a bit fine. What do you think of the idea that if you wanted, if you're in the first week, because you're going to, some will be presenting in first and some will be presenting in second. During the first week, you can just present. Uh, I don't know. It's tricky. Something might go wrong when you present. I think you're safe, Lauren. I think you're safer if you make a video and then do a presentation. And if the presentation works, just pay attention to that, not the video. If it works, but if it doesn't work, we've got the video. Are you happy with that? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was just a bit surprised because I didn't realize we were like restricted to a certain type of formatting. Oh, no, do whatever you want in the video. Oh, I just mean like a video, you know? Oh, uh, do other things if you want to. No, no, the, sorry, the video is just a summary of the project. It's not the project. The project is the project. Everyone's going to look at it and we're going to watch it. And if it's a book or a poem or a movie or a website or a, a war game or a, whatever it is, that's the project. It's just we have to have some sort of artifact that, that everyone gets to see. That's all. Okay. And now we're all separate to each other. I think the video is, is pretty essential because otherwise how can people see what you've done? We have to show it to them in some way. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think the video needs to be like a high quality professional cut. No, 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 no. It can just be like a pop into a Zoom meeting, talk about your projects for two minutes and then like while you're recording it and that's yeah. it. Exactly right, Evan. That's right. It could just be a Zoom meeting that you just record of you presenting your stuff. And maybe you can get one or two friends to watch while you do it and clap and cheer or your parents. Or this. Oh, that was me. And that can we do like slides with like a voice track? Yeah, sure. Yeah, however you want. However you want. But do put your face up somewhere or smile or something just so people know it's you. And, but yeah, do whatever you want. You've got two to three minutes to do a piece of communication to demonstrate... Um, you know what you did for the something awesome and we no one's looking at it sort of crossly or strictly or trying to mark it meanly everyone's looking at it just rejoicing in what you've done and really proud of you it's this really happy time so yeah yeah look if you're too shy to put your face on don't put your face on yep whatever works for you is fine by me absolutely um let me get to the marking because i reckon everyone's quite stressed so let me show you how we mark it and that might relax you a little bit The hints about things you could put in if you stuck at the last minute. So the deliverables, two minute public domain video. Oh, you put it in the public domain so we can actually take copies of it. Well, that's easy. It's technical, I think. Um, and the poster. Da, 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 da. All right, how we access them? How we assess them? All right, each one of the sections. So there's those five sections, and something awesome is one of the sections is assigned to a category, is given a mark, either satisfactory, woohoo! Well, that's clearly met the objectives of the course. Well done. I'm expecting no one is gonna get less than satisfactory. I would be astonished. Um, then the next one is amazing. Includes nearly all the stuff we wanna see and it's got strong evidence. Woohoo! I hope we get amazing. And then there's an 11. You can get 11 out of 10 if it's just so amazing that your tutor is struck dumb and turns to stone because it's the most incredible thing anyone's ever seen. So they're the marks you can get and then not satisfactory. So basically aim for a satisfactory. You, if you put work into it, there's almost no way you can't get a satisfactory. Um, and then amazing if what you've done is quite amazing and 11. Well, we sometimes get two or three elevens. Um, okay. So that's quite, can you see it's not strict marking? It's not scary. Um, it's just a chance for you to show off. 
And notice that students from previous years have reported that when you go for a job interview, an actual real one, you tend to spend quite a lot of your time talking about the things that you put in this portfolio. So it is, this is a dry run for when you're going for your first job interview because you are now starting to work out who you are, what your strengths are, and the things you've done as evidence to support that. And you're practicing putting that in. So I just want you to view this as an exercise to practice your ability to showcase yourself and what you've done. And at the same time, maybe yourself reflect on what you've done and feel good about it. Um, is not a scary sort of marquee type exercise. Um, are there any questions about the something awesome? Uh, it says yeah, the next uh, Let's go a Andrew first and then keep going. We've got lots of the time. Okay, um, if we did something that was challenge based, so like a CTF or similar, how would we go about doing a video demonstrating what wow. our project was? Wow, um, did you do a CTF? Uh, no, I did something else, it was similar. I did hack the box challenges. Oh, okay, so you did all the hack, so yeah, so just produce some artifacts from it. So have you done reflective blog entries as you've gone? Is there some way you've helped other people? You've done write-ups or? Um, what, have, what have you, what have you physically done? Oh yeah. Like I've done write-ups and stuff, but like, uh, like I wouldn't make a video about how I did write-ups. No, no, but the write-ups could help you with the video. So you could just talking and the video is just you talking to the camera, jump in a zoom room and say, hi, my name's Andrew. I started this course really wanting to learn low level hacking. Um, and so I found hack the box. And I decided for my something awesome, I was going to do as many of the challenges in it as I wanted, as I could. So I've been working on it over the semester. Um, I've done now 27 of the challenges. I reckon I've probably put 600 hours into it. I was really a bit stupid and probably all my other marks have suffered for it. Thank heavens for the virus. And, um, and it's been an incredible experience. What have I learned? Okay, here are the three main things I've learned. Blah, 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 and blah. What would I suggest to someone else wanting to do this? Well, I reckon you should start here, do this, do this, do this, do this. If I was doing it again, how would I do it differently? Well, da, 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 da. What's the thing I'm most proud of? Oh, this challenge here, it was really hard. I nearly gave up about 17 times. And then I saw something on an ad for the public service Department of Finance, it suddenly gave me an insight into how to solve it with paleo banana bread. Uh, I jumped around the house shouting, here's a picture of me going, Eureka, Eureka. I didn't take a photo of the time, so this is a reenactment of it. Um, and I was so happy and I got it out. And I'm, this is what I'm gonna do in the future. I always wanna do this now. And I would really encourage anyone that's themselves interested in learning how to do low level hacking to try hack the box. And I guess what I'm going to do now in my life moving forward is I'm going to write some of these myself. I just now I'm so obsessed with uh, CTFs that I think I'd like to write some T CTFs. Maybe that'll even be my honors project. There you go. That'd be a great presentation. What do you think of that? Okay. Uh, uh, that's pretty good. It gives me something to work with. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And if you can't think of ideas, ask your tutor how you can present it because they're excellent or just someone else um, that you know, or someone else in the course. Basically we just need to know, what was impressive about what you did? So it was a personal challenge. It was meeting a goal you always wanted to have. It was something a little bit scared about. It was something that took a lot of effort. It was something you had to, have to be persistent for. It was something that involved you changing your character in some way. You have to be more organized, more this or that. Whatever about it that really impressed you, that you really like, tell us. It's your ability to show off why what you did was fantastic. So don't just say, I did this, this, and this. Tell us why that's meaningful to you and why you're sort of proud of it. And then show your analytical skills by talking about things you wish you'd done better and things if you could do it again. And I always like including advice for other people. Just saying for people that are watching this video who themselves are going to do something awesome next year, my strong tips are blah, blah, and blah. That's helping other people. So yeah, keep going. There was more questions. Unless Andrew, you had anything else? Oh, no, no, no. That's it. Thanks. Um, can't wait. I had, to... yeah, shoot. I had a question about the comment in the next section. Uh, how strongly should I be focusing on this eight minutes? Um, is that a pretty hard, fast eight minutes? It reads as if it is. Yeah. But to actually articulate a whole something awesome in eight minutes well, and the rest of it in eight minutes is probably going to be a struggle for some. Yeah, it's hard. So um, what you have to do is for each of the sections, the mark is going to spend eight minutes reading it. So. Oh, per section. I miss, must have missed that. Yeah. yeah. So um, what they'll do is they'll open it up. So that's about a page. It could be two pages if they're fast readers and there's not much clicking for them to do. So I'd try and keep it at a page. It's a page where you put your most important things. So you've probably done 50 things, but you're in a job interview. If you tell them 50 things, they're going to fall asleep. Don't think of it as a job interview. Think of it as you're going on a date. It's a first date 
And if this goes well, you guys might have a relationship. So what are you going to do? Are you going to bore them with long lists of stuff? No. They say, tell me about yourself. You go, I'm glad you asked. Here's 17 things about me. Instead, you're going to say, well, what's the one or two most important things about me to say? And then you're going to say the most important one first and the second most important one second. And then you'll give some funny examples or powerful or compelling examples so they believe it and you're not just saying it. You can't just say, tell me about me. Tell me about you. Oh, well, I'm really kind. I'm a really kind person. <laughs> That's not convincing. Say, I think kindness is really important and I volunteer for St. Vincent de Paul doing this every week and I do this and that. Yeah, no, that's, 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 uh, I'd marry you. So um, that's um, what we're looking for here. I reckon in eight minutes, you can do a summary of one or two key things and then just have links to the rest and they'll click through and links. I mean, don't even have them reading the whole eight minutes. They'd, they're probably, Chris will talk about this more, but they'd like to skim read what you've written in about four minutes and then spend the remaining four minutes clicking on links and investigating. So they go, he said his time manager was really good and he did everything on time. I don't really believe that. I'm just going to start checking some of his activities because he's given me links to all the activities he's done. I'm just going to double check that and they'll click through. Or he said he did this and he noticed this amazing thing and there's something awesome. I missed, I missed that before. I'm going to go and find out more about that because that sounds really interesting. Do you but, remember... Sorry, I don't want to cut you off, Richard, but um, we did speak earlier today about um, that you've got seven seconds to make a first impression. So all of your tutors know you now, but we don't know the quality of work that you're going to put in for a final assessment. So that sort of, when we open the page, you've got seven seconds to really impress us and see, you know, this is the amazing work that people have done. And then when I've got that sort of feel for where things are going to be going, then I'll dive deep into the evidence and make sure that that first impression is accurate. That's right. That's right. That's very good. Thanks, Chris. More questions? Vidya, did you have a question? No, no. Oh, I just thought you were putting your hand up. Oh, okay. No. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I, I just wanted to summarize it. So we just put in the impressive part in the video and uh, write a summary about the project in the report. Yeah, so there's... Um, so there's the normal four criteria and then the fifth criteria is there's something awesome. Yeah. Now the normal four are all sort of treated the same. You hand in a one or two page thing for each of those and have eight minutes to mark it. The something awesome is the only thing that's a little bit different. That's got a one page poster that summarizes the whole thing. And it's also got a video. And the reason we do that is because we want you to present your something awesomes. We don't want them just handed in and not seen by anyone. We want you to stand up and tell the world what you've done, the world being your tutorial class, and everyone in your class get to hear what you've done, your tutor get to hear what you've done. Um, so it's a chance to talk about it and show it. So that's why there's this sort of um, visual presentation side to it. And then the reason for the video is just because we've now got so many students that will be spreading it over time. And it's just not fair to give someone an extra week, I think. Yeah. It, does that make sense? Yeah. Are there any more questions? I have a feeling there was a question at the beginning. Um, I have a quick question. Um, so with the something awesome, I'm assuming it's not just about um, like selling your like good strengths. It's also about selling, you know, your personality as well to sort of get employers to see if you're a good fit or not, as well as being good or not. Right. Um, no, I see where you're going. I think that would be unfair to do that. I think we just want to know that you've done something awesome and it's not your personality at all. Um, in fact, really, we don't. I know when I've employed people in companies, um, personality is not important. You do want a good fit. So you want values that are the same. But I've worked with shy people and extroverted people, extroverted people and outgoing people and inarticulate people. And they're all really wonderful people. So yeah, it's not about personality. It's not about show. It's not about pizzazz. I mean, it's about show in the sense that you've got to communicate some ideas. So put some thought into it. Don't just turn up blobbling along and not really having planned it. I mean, plan it and work out a good piece of communication. You've only got three minutes, but, um, but yeah, no, it's not about your personality at all. The, the only thing that comes close to personality being assessed is in the security attitude, in your security mindset. We do want to check that you're analytical um, and we do want to check that you're constantly reflecting on things and analyzing things. But even if that's not normally in your personality, you can still do it for this course. So you know, in a sense, that's even more impressive. Is that okay, Jenna? 
Uh, yeah, I'm guessing it might be a little harsher in the real world, though. Oh, maybe not. I, I don't know. You're only getting basically the question in front of everyone when you're talking is: Is this amazing, or is this, you know, clear satisfactory? Um, yeah. Pretty evident within seconds whether it is or not. You yourself would know. Um, uh, oh well, I actually know about your project. It it actually probably is amazing. So. Yeah, just make sure people realize how amazing it is what you do. Okay. Yeah, uh, but I'm not marking you now in the lecture in front of everyone. You can't be cross if it's. <laughs> <laughs> but but it has the potential to be amazing. What what Chandler's done is uh, he's fooled around with rootkits. He's tried to teach himself rootkits, and the thing that's really impressive um, isn't the actual rootkit stuff. It's the process of trying to write a rootkit and the things you need to understand to write it, and then the things you need to deal with it when you're trying to test them are quite vast and huge and require this enormous patience and perseverance not to give up. And that is actually really impressive. So if your presentation demonstrates that you've done that sort of thing, then that's really good. And no one will care about personality or what clothes you're wearing or anything like that. I will take this opportunity to say, I crashed the computer by opening the man pages. <laughs> well, sometimes attackers don't want the victims to read the man pages. Sorry, what's a man page? I'm a programmer. <laughs> oh, oh, you <laughs> acronym. Man page stands for man <laughs> about nothing. Uh, a man page, for those that aren't uh, computer nerds, is uh, uh, it, it's almost as bad as an acronym. It's a jargon. It's a shortening of manual because computer scientists, when they were programmers in the old days, every letter meant you had to punch something else on a punch card. So you were stingy and you did make your programs short. And so everything was given really short names and manual as in the instruction manual, that's way too long for anyone to ever type on a card. So we just called it man. I don't know why we didn't just call it M. <laughs> yeah, so we still do that, don't we? It's very sad. We should call it manual. Yeah. So when you tried to read the manual, the computer exploded and that is very impressive. Um, more questions. Cause I did have a sense that someone was asking a question at the same time Andrew did at the very beginning and they backed off. Did they want to come back now? I think that might have been me, but I already asked my question. Oh, okay. All right, cool. All right. Thank you, everyone. Well, if there's no more questions, I've got a fun little puzzle for you in our remaining four minutes. Oh, I didn't put it I on. have a quick question about yeah. communication. So just then we used some jargon or like an abbreviation of man. But like, I, I almost felt that for people who understand what that is, you kind of lose your audience while you explain things. Yes. So although you say don't use abbreviations and you know, don't use all this technical jargon because it excludes people in the same way, taking the time to explain everything when you have people who do understand is almost losing your audience and they might feel a bit like you're being a bit condescending or something even not that you were just then, but like I feel in, especially in research settings, that could be the case. Yeah. It's really hard. I mean, the, the question is know your audience and say what you have to say for your audience. And then, so what you're really talking about there, Lauren, is, uh, uh, sorry, Laura, is the, the problem of diversity. If you, what if you've got a diverse audience and the problem of diversity is a nightmare and Tom will know all about this from first year. That's our biggest diversity problem. We've got people coming in who can program and have been programming all their lives and people who can't program at all. And we don't want to separate them into different streams because that's not fair because after a course or two, they'll all be intermingled. And if we separate them into different streams, they might feel that they're not as good and the people that start behind might feel that that's where they belong, you know, red eye, brown eye, blue eye sort of thing. So, um, so yeah, diversity is a real problem with an audience. So how I always try and deal with it is I try, if I'm going to explain something that people probably already know, but I do want to explain it because I do know there are several people in here who don't know that. Um, I try and make it a bit funny. So at least you get some value from me explaining it and maybe I can make one or two other little interesting points. Um, so maybe you got a chance to think about why we had short names or notice that we have this propensity to abbreviate things. And, you know, maybe there was a little bit of interest in there, but, um, yeah, I call that dog whistling, which now unfortunately has horrible political terms, which is in every piece of communication, I try and put things in for as much of the different diversity as I have in the room. I try and put things in will interest those particular people, but to the other people, hopefully it's not too boring. So they don't notice them. So it sort of tunes out. So if we are explaining something, I might in the words I do, or a couple of throwaway remarks I put in, I might put 
things in there that if you're already really on top of this, it's still really interesting because you've got some new way of thinking or some interesting puzzle to go and follow. Um, but I'll do it in such a way, hopefully, if I'm successful, that the people listening that don't know anything are reassured that I'm explaining it and they don't notice there's this high level other thing going on as well. Um, so yeah, diversity is hard. Either teach them separate things, but I like them all together or look after one and bore the others. That's hard. Or try and entertain everyone. And that's what good comedians and entertainers do. Um, if you watch a comedian structure a set, they're trying to do it so that they're appealing to everyone. And it's quite tricky to do that. And they have to appeal to their long-term fans as well as new people that have never heard their stuff before. And yeah, it's a challenge. I mean, that's what makes it fun. That's why research is fun. It's not an easy thing. You're right, Lauren. Uh, Laura. All right. Can I add something to that? You can, Tom. But then let me say this fun joke that I do want to say at the end. Um, so there's a really great talk about C++, a language that I know very little about. But it's basically talking about common bugs and it's trying to communicate to people, you know, the bugs that they might have in their code. And there's this point that the speaker makes at the start where he basically says, there are two types of people in this room, the people who have not seen these bugs before and the people who have seen these bugs before, who've seen them a hundred times. And he's like, you know, if you haven't seen them before, then you'll learn something. But if you have seen them before, the conversation we want to have is how do we stop them? And so there's this really great dichotomy in how he's explaining it about like, he knows that there are two parallel audiences and every time he's speaking, he's trying to address both concerns. So it's something I try and do as well with like, you know, I know there are people who know a lot and who don't. So trying to talk about both things at once is really yeah. kind of cool. And I really like the way that he flagged what he was doing. That almost is, that's part of getting in the mind of the people too. So now people are perhaps a bit more tolerant when he does it, but also is flagged that there's something in here for you because the worst thing about being a smart person or a person who's knowledgeable already is when you're listening to something, you make up your mind pretty quickly if there's anything in it for you and you can think, ah, oh, switch off. I won't get anything from this. And then you can miss all sorts of wonderful things. So I guess that's flagging early on that even if you're smart and I'm talking a bit in the beginning and I'm losing your attention because it's boring, it's worth sticking in there because there'll be some fun puzzles for you later on. Uh, that's very clever. So I like that. And thank you for sharing that. And if you can share the link to that, I'm going to go. Listen. I can try and find it. Yeah, sure. Um, and I wasn't trying to shut you up, but I do appreciate that you gave us this tiny little second at the end. So I wanted just to give you a puzzle. And actually I've got three puzzles, <laughs> but I'll do them really fast. Puzzle number one, I'm going to toss a coin. And if it's heads, I don't know, maybe I, maybe there's two of us and we want to make sure we want it. There's two of us. We both want to present in week one, not in week two for the something awesome. And we have to decide who's going to do it. So I say, Hey, uh, who's it? Who am I tossing with? Maybe I'm going to toss with who's some, Lucy. Can I toss with you? Yes. So we're going to, you, so I'm going to um, just toss a coin and heads. I, I win tails. You win. Okay. And I toss the coin. Oh, sorry. You lost. What do you think of that protocol? It's a bit dodgy because I can't tell if what the actual result was. Yes. So um, ignore the fact that I could have tossed it on screen and we could have had a camera doing it because then forging the result is a little bit harder, but you can see it's still possible. If you're a computer in a darkened room and all you're getting is bits coming in and someone tells you those bits mean in the real world, the head was tossed, um, then you're just, uh, there's a trust thing here. So my challenge for you, challenge number one is, Let's get the visual element out because it's distracting because we sort of think that can't trick us. So let's just um, suppose we're on the telephone. What's a protocol you and I could follow? So we toss a coin, there's a 50-50 chance and we're both convinced at the end that it was fair. That's puzzle number one. Can anyone work out how to do a distributed coin toss? Puzzle number two. I know a secret. I don't know, what is it? I know... Um, I know, I know the ingredients for Coca-Cola and your Pepsi. And if you give me a million dollars, I'll tell you the ingredients for Coca-Cola. And you say, no way, you could be ripping me off. You tell me the ingredients, then I'll give you a million dollars. And I say, what do I say? I say, okay, I trust you. Here's the ingredients. Oh yeah. Thanks saga. And then I give me the money. Um, that's tricky, isn't it? Because I've got a secret I want to sell. 
but how can I convince someone that I have the secret without telling them the secret? And when I tell them the secret, the secret's lost its value as a secret. So my question um, is number two, Tom, you were going to say, how I can, gonna, yeah. Calf isn't here. So I'm going to have to say it, but if you put it on the blockchain then everything just works. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we we're not going to do that. We, we're going to imagine in all our answers, we can't say the word blockchain. Um, because, Thank you. Because blockchain uses a lot of cryptographic solutions to achieve an overall effect. Um, and, but I want you to work out what the actual cryptographic solution is that causes it. And lo and behold, blockchain as part of its mixture of stuff uses that. But yeah, yeah. So the smallest solution you can come up with, much less elaborate than blockchain, but yeah, you're right. Blockchain would solve this. That lets you do a distributed coin toss. That lets us sell a secret. Let me sell a secret to you, but um, you pay me the money. We're both convinced I know the secret, but I don't have to tell you the secret. And my third puzzle, oh, I'll tell you the third puzzle next week because we're out of time. So uh, I'll see you all on Wednesday, everyone. It was lovely talking to you. Um, and I hope you're all well and stay good. And we'll have lots of fun on Wednesday. It's going to be a fun week. Okay. See you all. Bye. Bye, Richard. Bye, Richard. Bye, Richard. Oh, Bye, Richard. Richard. Bye, Richard. Bye, Richard. Thank you. Oh, this is nice. I'm just going to say he's saying goodbye to everyone. This is nice. <laughs> Bye. Bye, Luan. Adrian. Hey, Oliver. Lachlan. Uh, Laura. Kristen. And Tiffy. How oh, nice. And Evan. And who are you? Adrian. And Evie. And Rue. And Gaurav. <laughs> hey, Richard. Gary. Kerry. Yes. Who's that talking? Uh, Callum. Where are you, Callum? I'm just trying to find you. I don't have my webcam on because oh. I've got people behind me. Oh, um, okay. Could you put that list of books which you recommended on the Happy at Home page? Yes, that's a great idea. And if you need a copy of one of them and you can't get it, I'll post it to you if you want. They're awesome books. Thank you. Right. we Will do, Callum. And thanks for the lecture today. Oh, it was a pleasure. And you share some good books back if you've got any good ones. I will, certainly. Thank you. All right. See ya. Bye. Hey, John, I really like your name with all those H's. That's really cool. That's really funny. I've not seen that one before. That is very good. Rare to see a new idea. See ya, uh, see ya, Edward. See ya, Andrew. See ya, Bofe. See ya, Iris. What have we got? Andrew, Iris, iPad. <laughs> Evie's still here. Kerry. Iris, Brendan. Oh, Brendan. Hey, thanks for doing the recording. That was fantastic. You are a complete legend. Thank you. Thank you. Does everyone know Brendan recorded the lecture and saved a copy? So even when I lost the recording, he had one. Oh, what a good man. See you. Uh, uh, like, hey, Richard. Ah, there you are, Brendan. Hey. Oh, man. <laughs> you made me smile. If you could have seen <laughs> my face when I realized what you'd done. Thank you. You got to This one's recording right now. It's like, um, I've got it sort of like it's like plugged in yes. and then it's sort of like I don't know if it's gonna cause like a weird loop thing, but it's plugged into the TV over there. Oh. So yeah, and that's that's doing the backup lecture. Um just in case there's any problems or anything like that. Man. What what year are you in at the moment? Uh, I'm a part-time student, so um it's kind of complicated. Like I'm sort of like like I've been doing it at a very slow sort of half rate. So I've been at the uni for about four years, but um Oh, I'm sort of, sort of in the middle of second year, sort of. Oh, okay. So you still might have three or four years to go. Yeah, um, I think it's like a uh, this year and then next year. I think oh, I've got to add it up, but yeah, it should be something like that. So when you go, if you ever need a reference, make sure you get one from me. Okay, and, we'll do. Thank you, Richard. And you should try out for the Amazon um, project. You know, we run this project where you go to Amazon and do cloud security with them. What's that project? So we run this project, well, whenever we can, and we're running it at the moment, we'll probably run it next year, where um, Amazon come and teach cloud security to some of the students. And they actually go to work at Amazon uh, doing this, oh, really? stuff, not paid by Amazon, but in the Amazon offices and stuff. And their security team is so nice. Oh, but that's the, so cool. They get to know you and you get to know them. And it leads to awesome jobs with a really awesome team because I really like those guys and their values. Um, so you should definitely do it because you're a sort of more mature student and you've got this sort of, I really like your approach to just doing things. That's sort of exactly what they're looking for. So try that project if you're interested and yeah, then definitely. it could well be a click between you and them. Sounds great. Thanks, Richard. Yeah. Okay. See ya. See you later.
And who, there's someone here without a name. Who, who are you? There's someone who's got an empty name. That's so clever. Oh, another new thing. Who's can good? you give me a clue? What's the first letter of your name? It's a girl. I can see you. <laughs> You're not going to tell me. Oh, that's so cool. Oh, I know your name. It's unmute. <laughs> and who, who else have we got? We've got Tom, Kerry, uh, Abhijit, Ryan, Andrew, Jazz, Ravin, Beaufay, and Iris. All right. It was lovely seeing you all. Oh, and Lachlan. Hey, hey, how did it go tonight? Lachlan, was that all right? Yeah, no, I had to step out for a chunk in the middle. Um, yeah, good. Good. While you were stepped out, Chris and I reworked the marking of the whole um, <laughs> portfolio. You'll be pleased. I believe you. <laughs> I believe you. That's a joke. Don't throw me under the bus like that, Richard. <laughs> and walking pool of chaos. That's all I can. <laughs> That's a tomorrow problem. <laughs> yes, and we really love having you. It was fantastic having you in the lecture. Thanks for being yes, here. Yes. Grinning the whole time. It was very, very good. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Oh, it's EB. I didn't recognize you. Are those glasses new? No. Oh, I just got Same old, same old. Sorry. <laughs> Same old, same old. Same old, same old. Oh, I'm happy. Okay. Well, was, thanks, Evie. You're doing a great job. I keep hearing good things about you. Keep it up. Bye, Richard. Right. See you. See ya. Is it pronounced Abhijit? Uh, yeah. See you. Yeah, you can call me Abhi. Abhi. Bye-bye. Abhi. Yeah. Good right. night. Good night. Good night to you all. I'm thinking I'm... Oh, Lachlan's waving goodbye. I'm thinking I'm going to go because I'm keen to find out what, what the situation is with my dad. But is there anyone that wants to just have a chat? I don't want to go if there's someone who needs to talk about something. I just want to quickly say, uh, you should figure out how to like, do the uh, show hide video, hide non-video participants thing. Yes. Because then you get everyone's faces on the screen. All right. I will. I'll practice with that. Thank you. You also just set up the gallery view. So if you stop sharing your content, Richard. Yes. Um, and then on the i believe it's the oh, right i can side. do that can i so yeah, you you yeah. can set up so that you can see everybody's faces um you just need to select gallery view instead of how do i stop sharing pause share does that there's a button at the top red one oh, shit. Is that it? Yeah. yeah so up the top right um it usually says speak of you if you click speak of you it'll switch it to gallery view and okay that's fantastic and then it will show you like is that all the webcams yeah, I can see it. And Is then it you just right click one of them. Right click one of them. And then we go chat, pin video. Chat, pin video. And do I do pin video on first screen? No, uh, the one underneath pin video will, should be hide. And now I've got pin video on second screen, spotlight video, make host, make co host, allow record, remove, rename, put on hold. So if you click on somebody that doesn't have their webcam active, like uh, Carrie down the bottom. Sorry, Carrie, um, picking on you. Um, and then hide non-video participants should be on that. Oh, yeah, it is down the bottom. I'm just yeah. going to briefly, Gary, but I'll put you back in a second. Oh, yeah, that's cool. I can see everyone with cameras on. Oh, that's really it's nice. Really good. And I just double check. It's not affecting your view. It's just no. not. It's just no. Yours. That's fantastic. Well, I've got a big screen up now so I can see as many faces as possible. It, it might be on the recording, but other than that. It's oh, yeah, that's okay. And there's the wave. I really like that picture. Hmm? Oh, yeah. My mom got it for me after I came back. You got it? Oh, that's right. It's really nice. All right. Is there anyone else? Thanks, Evan. That was useful. Does anyone else need to talk to me or anything they want to say? I had one question. Speaking of the recording, does Lisa have access to download it? Yeah, she should. Cool. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. I'll talk to her about some stuff. Thanks. See ya. I think, Richard, you, I, and Lisa have a phone call tomorrow. I think, was she talking to you about that? Oh, good. Yeah, she'll, <laughs> she communicates that to me is she'll have stuck it in my calendar. Okay, no worries. Like a buffer overflow. I just have to exit. <laughs> <laughs> so, no dramas. So, I was just making sure that we were all in on the same page. I'll look forward to that. Cool. Okay. All right. I'm off. I'll catch up. See you, Evan. See you, Oliver. <laughs>